representing our armed forces now, those represent the men that we left behind on the battlefield. The ones that are alive represent those who died on the battlefield. And so to me, it's an honor to be able to shake these guys' hands and tell them thank you. So tonight, uh, we have uh, Brother Chris Pinto. He's going to start us off tonight. That is exactly where you left off uh, last night. And uh, today, I, I asked him uh, to do Tabernacle Online with me. And I called him and talked with him. And he was so excited about what he was preparing for tonight. And I said, I'm going to leave you to it. I'm going to let you keep working on that. Because I know how it is. When you get with a bloodhound, sniff something out. You want to keep chasing. And I know that feeling. I know how that works. And uh, so I'm going to bring him up here shortly. And then Brother Red Kelly's here with us tonight. We appreciate these men and the work and the labor that they do. They come from two different backgrounds, two different uh, upbringings, two different, and they have two different spiritual gifts. But God has blessed them both. And we brought them here tonight to uh, share their heart with us concerning, number one, the issue of our Constitution, our constitutional rights. And the Second Amendment, like I uh, read last night, none of the other amendments, nobody's talking about doing away with those. Yeah. The only one that they're talking about getting rid of, in my opinion, is the main one that stands and protects the rest of the constitutional rights. Yeah. If you get rid of that one, you just hit the first domino. That's all you've done. The rest of them will fall. My interest in it is that I want my children and my grandchildren to be able to listen to the gospel preached the same way I heard it preached. That's what I want. That's what I care about. And I care about the, the longevity of being able to preach that gospel in this country for as long as I can. That's what God has called us to do. And so I appreciate those of you who came out. We want you to feel at home. Uh, it's, it's not a debate that we're having. We're giving out ideas that come from American history, that come from our Constitution, and come from the Word of God, Amen. which we believe is superior to every If the foundations be destroyed, we, we don't stand a chance. So we need our foundations secure. We're going to leave this in the hand of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, and I'm going to have Brother Chris Mitchell come up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, gathering us together today. Thank you, Lord, for giving Brother Red his traveling safety and all that rain and storm. We thank you for bringing both these men here tonight. We thank you for what we heard last night. We ask you, dear Heavenly Father, that you use this meeting here with those that have gathered in this building tonight, plus those that are listening in, watching online. Father, that you would instill in the hearts of those who would listen. Father, that our nation was built upon certain principles, certain foundations. These rights and these principles come from our Creator. They come from you. They're not to be taken away. Father, as you told Paul to tell us in Galatians to stand fast in the liberty, wherewith Christ has made us free, Father, we desire to stand fast in that liberty for ourselves and our posterity. Father, we pray, Lord, that you bless tonight's meeting, bless the word that goes forth from this pulpit. We thank you for these men that have yielded themselves over to your service. We thank you, dear God, for the gifts that each one of them has. And we pray, dear God, that you would use them, Father, uh, to glorify your kingdom and to magnify your word above all things. So, Father, we just ask tonight that you give us a spirit of peace, that you give us a spirit of love and a sound mind tonight. Father, you would guide us in your Holy Spirit, Lord, to teach us and preach to us on the inside what's being presented on the outside. Bless and honor. 
Brother Mike said, we ended, we talked about really the history of the Bible and the history of the right to keep and bear arms are in many ways intertwined from the beginning. Because the right to bear arms grew out of the continual persecution against Christian people one century after another. And we talked about last night in last night's presentation, for those who may not have been here, how the Bible was for centuries the forbidden book. And how uh, Christians continually had to live in fear. Unless you were a Catholic priest, Catholic priests were the only ones authorized to actually read a Bible. But for the ordinary citizens, it was forbidden. It was against the law. If you were found with a Bible, uh, you would be arrested. You would often be tortured and killed, burnt at the stake for owning a Bible. Uh, parents were burnt at the stake for teaching their children the Ten Commandments. These are aspects of the Inquisition that have been lost to history. And as I said last night, well, you couldn't own a Bible, you couldn't teach the Ten Commandments, and you could not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you understand our history, things like freedom of speech came about because Christians wanted the freedom to preach the gospel. Okay, freedom of the press came about because Christians wanted the freedom to make copies of the Bible. In fact, when the printing press was first developed, uh, the very first book that was published was a copy of the Bible. And you had, for centuries, you would have a priest or a monk or an academic, somebody who knew language, would make a copy of the Bible. It would take them 10 months to a year to produce just one Bible. Then the Inquisition would come along, they would take that Bible and cast it into the fire, and it would be destroyed within a matter of minutes. Now once the printing press came along, and you had the development of movable type, they were producing the first year, I think they put out 200 Bibles, which was unheard of. 200 Bibles in a year, and then the numbers just increased from there. And so what happened was the, uh, the people who believed the Bible wanted to get the Bible into the hands of a common man, they produced more Bibles than the Inquisition could burn. That's basically what happened. And last night we talked about great men like Desiderius Erasmus and William Tyndale, whose ambition was, on both counts, to get the Bible into the hands of the common people. That was, that was Erasmus's dream. He talked about it, and William Tyndale, uh, we talked about last night how at the British Library, they have a Tyndale copy of the New Testament, which is about this size, and it's, it was what Tyndale contributed to the idea of a personal Bible. Prior to that, Bibles had been very large, huge, oversized books, very heavy to carry. And Tyndale produced the first pocket Bible, the idea of a Bible you could fit in your satchel and you could take it with you, your own personal Bible. <laughs> because he believed that the common people had to be able to read the Word of God to develop a close personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he literally laid down his life so that we could have the Bible in our language. Tyndale is often called the father of the English Bible. And when you read a King James Bible today, about 85% of your King James Bible, the authorized version, is the translation work of William Tyndale. Beautiful phrases like, our father which art in heaven, and fight the good fight, uh, and looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Many beautiful phrases were crafted by William Tyndale in particular. And you really only appreciate them, I think, uh, when you compare them to other English translations that have been done. But what happened was the reformers resisted the Inquisition and the false doctrines of the papacy. And this led to the Great Reformation. Then we talked about uh, how about 90% of the countries in Western Europe went from being countries under the Pope, under the Holy Roman Empire, and about 90% of them turned away, and they became Protestant Reformed countries. Then in 1540, you had a man named Ignatius Loyola, who was a Spanish soldier and a Catholic priest, 
And he launched with Pope Paul III what is called the Counter-Reformation in 1540. And so then you had the Jesuits. They began trying to overturn the Protestant Reformation by any means possible. Uh, and we talked about their history last night, about how they're seen as a very diabolical, wicked, evil order. How, how they were behind things like the gunpowder plot in 1605. Uh, they launched more than 25 assassination attempts against Queen Elizabeth I, trying to kill the Protestant Queen. And they conducted a series of massacres, like the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, uh, like the Massacre of Walpenses in 1655, uh, the Irish Rebellion of 1641, where it was said more than 100,000 English Protestants were butchered by Jesuit mobs in Northern Ireland. Then you had the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. The Edict of Nantes was very much like the U.S. Constitution. It protected the rights, the religious freedoms of Protestants in France. And the Jesuits worked for years to manipulate it, overturn it. And once they did, they were able to slaughter, torture, uh, and demoralize the Protestant population there in France. And the reason that's important was that we we'll talk more about this tomorrow. But we have about 28 Jesuit colleges and universities in our country today, right now. The current Pope, Pope Francis, is a Jesuit priest, the first Pope in history. We have a Jesuit priest sitting as the chaplain of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. right now. The Pope just recently called for all the countries in the world to give up arms, okay? just happened a few days ago on Breitbart. You find it on Breitbart. Mike and I were talking about it. So all of these massacres were taking place, and that is when our God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian yeah. forefathers, Amen. they turned their attention from the church, and then they began to turn their focus on the state. And they demanded that Romans 13 be obeyed as it is written. Because it says that the government is to operate as the minister of God. And to be the minister of God to be for good. And so a government that's butchering its own people is not the minister of God for good. And so what we came to last night was Oliver Cromwell, the great Puritan leader. And there you see in the statue of Cromwell that stands before the houses of parliament there in England. And you'll notice Cromwell is standing and he has his hand on a book. That book is the Bible. Amen. And his other hand on a sword. And you have the poem about the great battle of Naseby where Cromwell defeated King Charles I. Uh, and it says, uh, the servant of the Lord with his Bible and his sword. It's this idea that preceded in modern times the Bible and the gun. This is where it comes from. It comes from our Puritan forefathers. Uh, and if you study Oliver Cromwell and his great Puritan Ironsides, they are the ones who developed the phrase, we have no sovereign but God and no king but King Jesus. That's where that phrase came from. On Cromwell's tomb is written the phrase, Christ, not man, is king. Because Cromwell believed that all men, all kings, all princes, all governments have a responsibility to submit themselves to the authority of God. And they have no right whatsoever to be in rebellion to the king of kings himself. So, there you have the Bible and the sword. Now, the Bible, of course, represents Ephesians chapter 6. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Whereas the sword, in Cromwell's usage represents Romans 13, where it says that rulers are not a terror unto good works, but unto the evil. If you do that which is evil, you ought to fear, for he bears not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath against those who practice evil. So Cromwell believed that we have the sword of the Spirit, and then we have the sword of godly government from Romans 13. That was the view of our Puritan forefathers. That was also the original understanding of a separation of church and state. This has been lost. Since the end of World War II, the ACLU 
and these other communist socialist groups in our country have completely twisted the concept of a separation of church and state. What our forefathers believed it represented was that the church preaches the gospel and handles matters of theology, but the state is also the minister of God and must uphold God's moral law. Jesus said there's two great commands, that we love God and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. In short, the church teaches how we love God, but the state must uphold how we love our neighbor as ourselves. Thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, thou shall not bear false witness, etc. This was the original understanding. And so it, it is not what we're being told today. The idea that the government is supposed to be without God and that you can't have the, uh, the Bible involved in government and this kind of thing. All of that is post-World War II shenanigans from the Marxists at work in our country. But we're going to talk about how, from the time of Cromwell forward, our English forefathers developed the right to bear arms. And what happened, because it's very, very important, the history behind this. The right to bear arms is sometimes called, there's a book by Joyce Lee Malcolm, and it's called To Keep and Bear Arms, The Origins of an Anglo-American Right. Origins of an Anglo-American Right. Well, Oliver Cromwell is well known because he opposed King Charles I. King Charles I was the King of England, and he, in a nutshell, the best way to explain Charles, in my opinion, is that he was working to try to bring back the Inquisition. Now, the English people had dealt with the Inquisition during the time of John Wycliffe and the Lollard preachers. Many of them were put to death. We talked about that last night. Then they uh, went through a period with Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary had many Protestants that were burnt at the stake again, for translating the Bible. Then they got Queen Elizabeth I, the Protestant queen. And under Queen Elizabeth, religious freedom was protected. The Bible was openly published. People could read it. They could own it. Scholars could study it, etc. So they had about 40 years under Queen Elizabeth I. So they knew religious freedom and a measure of toleration, probably not as much as we see today. But then Elizabeth dies, then you get King James I, who puts together the King James Bible, the authorized version. Uh, but you still have the Jesuits at work with their counter-reformation. They tried 25 times to assassinate Elizabeth. They failed. Then when King James comes in, literally one year after he commissions the translation of the, K the KJV, the authorized version, the Jesuits come up with the gunpowder plot in 1605, where they try to blow up the houses of parliament. They were gonna blow up the king, blow up the Protestant government, and try to reclaim England back to Rome. That was the plan. Uh, in fact, if you see movies like V for Vendetta, today in modern times, they completely twist the gunpowder plot. They try to make Guy Fawkes seem like a hero, whereas really he was an agent of the Jesuit order trying to destroy Protestant England and bring England back under the Dark Age and the Inquisition. That's what he was trying to do. But of course, they've twisted it around in modern times. Okay, so then James dies and his son, King Charles I, comes to the throne. Charles was apparently working with Jesuits to reform the Church of England in a very subtle way back toward Romanism. They were changing different rituals, ceremonies, policies within the churches. And Charles, his Archbishop of Canterbury was a man named William Laud. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury and he was manipulating many of these reforms, trying to force religious reforms on the Protestants there in England. He outlawed the Geneva Bible, put people in jail for it, People who resisted his theological reforms had their ears cut off, they had their noses slit, they had their faces branded with hot irons, they were being treated in a despicable manner. And so it's in the midst of this environment that Cromwell and his Puritan army rose up and took control. 
uh, Laud, prior to that, prior to the English Civil War, uh, Laud was condemned as a traitor and he was executed in 1645. Uh, King Charles I was defeated by uh, Cromwell and his army. Now it's very interesting, among, the, among our Christian forefathers in history, and I warn people about this if you study history books, modern history books, remember that they've been rewriting our history books since the 1920s, deliberately. Okay, the Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, all of this was discovered by the U.S. Congress back in the 1950s and what was called the Reese Committee in the 1950s. But yes, they've been rewriting our history books to get us away from the historic Christian teachings of our country and lead our population, our young people, into more of a Marxist socialist worldview. This is not just accidental that we're seeing happen in our country with all these young people running around shouting for socialism and this kind of thing. They have no idea that they have been systematically indoctrinated and brainwashed. And so they don't know what the principles of freedom are, what they were originally or where they came from. All right, so uh, Charles the uh, First, Cromwell defeated Charles at the Battle of Naseby. Okay, why? because Charles was violating the laws of God and violating the laws of England. He was in rebellion to God's law, where the gospel is concerned, and the laws of England itself. So Charles himself was overthrown. He was tried by Cromwell and his Puritan army and ultimately executed in 1649 as a traitor. And they literally cut his head off. Now. This is why many historians will say that Cromwell destroyed the doctrine of the divine right of kings. The divine right of kings, the way it's presented today, is as though if somebody thinks that they were appointed by God, they'll say, oh, that's very dangerous. But that wasn't the problem. Everybody generally agreed that kings, rulers, and governments are appointed by God because of Romans 13, which says there is no higher power but of God. The problem was, what does that mean? What the kings wanted it to mean, they wanted it to mean that they had absolute authority that could not be questioned. That no matter what they chose to do, good or bad, it had to be accepted by the people. And that you had to give these kings unlimited obedience. Now, I show in one of my films, A Lamp in the Dark, how this really began in many ways with the popes in the Middle Ages. The popes called for absolute obedience. In fact, Martin Luther, in one of his uh, declarations against the pope, talks about a papal document called Si Papa, in which the pope, according to Luther, said that even if he leads the whole world into hell, the world is obliged to obey him and they cannot question him. Then you had ca Catholic saints like Catherine of Siena, who also argued for absolute papal authority. And she argued, she, I mean, she literally said, even if the Pope is the devil incarnate, it doesn't matter. You've just got to put your head in his bosom and do whatever he says. And she literally says devil incarnate. They have Catherine of Siena's severed head in a church in Rome even today. She's one of the patron saints of Rome. And so the popes were calling for absolute obedience. Uh, they also called for the Catholic priesthood to not be prosecuted by the secular power. So if you had a priest, for example, who raped a young girl, uh, he was not to be prosecuted by the government. He was only to be charged or held accountable by the priesthood itself. You see, this was the whole issue with Thomas Becket centuries ago. And, of course, when the Reformation happened, there's nothing in the Bible that says that church leaders are not accountable to the government and to the moral law, to the moral code. There's nothing that says that whatsoever. And the priests actually used that as a way to keep themselves from being prosecuted. So they would commit these crimes, then they would go hide in an abbey somewhere, and then they would be smuggled around, and there would be no accountability. We see this happening even today. 
where you have these pedophile rat lines with the Catholic priests, and they're basically doing the same thing in our country that they have been doing for centuries across Europe. And the only reason there's any accountability is because of the great Protestant Reformation. Because our Protestant forefathers would not tolerate it. They believed that with God, there is no respect of persons, and he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done. That's what the scripture says. So that is how they judged King Charles I. This, this, is, this was revolutionary for Cromwell and his Puritan government. So they executed King Charles I. They executed William Laud, both men for treason. Now what's interesting is that Charles, here I just found this a short time ago. This was an article published by the Catholic Herald Friday, March 9th, 2018. 2018. You see, Charles I was officially an Anglican Protestant, but the reality is many people believed he was a closet Catholic, and he, was he and Archbishop Laud were working with Jesuits to subvert England. In fact, when William Laud died, um, you about the, quote, curiously Catholic tastes of They will usually almost always go to the doctrine of predestination and divine election, things like that. But we don't think often enough about Calvin's influence on government, his influence on government. Uh, but one of the teachings that he had was the resistance of ungodly government. And so he says, quote, for earthly princes lay aside their power when they rise up against God and are unworthy to be reckoned among the number of mankind. He says, we ought rather utterly to defy than to obey them whenever they wish to spoil God of his rights. Okay, now we all know the Declaration of Independence, where it says that all men are created and we're endowed by our creator who is God with certain unalienable rights. Okay, the reformers believed that you could not understand the rights of man unless you first understood the right of God. That was what they believed. And this is what Calvin is making a reference to here. Notice what he says. These earthly, uh, earthly rulers wish to spoil God of his rights. In other words, they're going to rob God of his rights to issue commands. So the question is, if God is the creator of all things, if he created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, does he have the right to issue a commandment? 
Does he have the right to say, thou shall not kill? Amen. Does he have the right to say, thou shall not steal? Amen. Does he have the right to say, man shall not lie with another man as he lies with a woman? Amen. Does he have the right to condemn homosexuality? Amen. Right now, we're being told by our government that God does not have the right to condemn this behavior. That God calls an abomination. God says that if a man dresses up like a woman, what they call transgenderism. Transgenderism goes back thousands of years, brethren. If you read in the Old Testament, the days of King Josiah, the Sodomites built up their houses along the walls of the temple. If you study those Sodomites, they were called the ancient Galilee. And the Galilee were a transgender cult. Okay? They, they were literally men who would castrate themselves in public and then they would don the, uh, the, the garments of a woman in this whole ritual that they had and it symbolized them being transformed into the image of their goddess. And these were apparently, according to church historians, these were the Sodomites in the days of King Josiah that he cleared out of there. Why? Because he read the commandments of God and he wanted to do right by God. So there's nothing new under the sun. But God calls men dressing up like women as much an abomination as homosexuality itself. Both are condemned by the Holy Scripture. Now, you, have, you go from Calvin to John Knox. Now, if I had to pick two guys that I thought were the most influential over what we believe in America today, it would be probably Cromwell and then John Knox. Because most of the reformers up to this point believed that nonviolent resistance should be the position of Christian people. That if rulers tell you to do something that's wrong, you resist them by not cooperating. Like the midwives in the Old Testament, where Pharaoh says they've got to strangle the children and they simply refuse to do it. They don't do, they, they resist by not doing what the king, the government told them to do. Knox, however, went a step further. Knox denounced, first of all, the orthodox doctrine of Christian obedience as sinful. In other words, the idea of obeying the government no matter what they tell you to do, he believed this was sinful. Why? Because the first commandment, God says, I am the Lord thy God. Ye shall have no other gods before me. And we talked about last night how the word gods is used for pagan gods, Apollo, Athena, and so on. But it's also used for kings, judges, magistrates, people in authority. And so uh, God says we should obey no authority above him. That we obey him above all. So Knox believed it was sinful to obey a wicked ruler. He even went a step further. Knox insisted that if the circumstances were right, Christians had the obligation to revolt against a tyrannical monarch. And he wrote, if you read his writings on this, he gave all sorts of examples from the Old Testament, not the least of which would be uh, Jehu. You read about Jehu, uh, who was an ordinary commander, and God sends Jehu to overthrow Queen Jezebel and then the two sons of Ahab that were ruling in both Judah and Israel, and he puts them all to death, puts the entire house of Ahab to death at the commandment of God. Okay, and that was just one example. But for Knox to come out and to give this argument that if you have a tyrannical, wicked government, that Christian people have a responsibility to resist them and if possible, overthrow them, this seems to, this preceded, literally, that teaching happens uh, about half a century before the English Civil War with Oliver Cromwell later on. And so Knox was most certainly part of the influence of Cromwell. Now, one of the uh, most dramatic events that happened in the 16th century was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572. And it is said by Joyce Lee Malcolm in the book To Keep and Bear Arms that this is what really caused Protestants to rethink their view and their responsibility toward government. 
And the reason is because up to that point with the Inquisition, if somebody was condemned by the Inquisition, you were arrested, you were brought in, there was a trial, you, you went back and forth, etc. Even though people believed it was unfair and unbiblical, nevertheless, there was a system of due process that happened, however imperfect. Now, with the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, what you had was you had the king and queen of France literally set up these Protestants, lied to them, deceive them into letting down their guard and coming to take part in this wedding ceremony. And then when they least expected it, they rose up and slaughtered them by the tens of thousands. They ultimately killed about 70,000 Protestants in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And there you see the queen, Catherine uh, de Medici, standing out and staring at the bodies of all the Huguenots, the French Protestants there that had been murdered the night before. And this caused the reformers to really rethink what their responsibility was. And of course, they were considering John Knox and what Knox was teaching uh, at the same time. In fact, if you look back at Knox, John Knox dies, interestingly, the same year of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, that same year. Now, the Irish Rebellion of 1641. I want to go over this briefly again, because there are some historians, I've heard at least one historian, and on the Irish Rebellion, you have a lot of controversy and debate. But at least one historian says, this is one of the great turning points in the history of Western civilization that many people are not familiar with. What happened was, you had English Protestants from the days of Bloody Mary. They were going up into Northern Ireland, into the Ulster area. And they made land purchases uh, for these areas of land that had been abandoned by the Irish Catholics. And so they purchased land and they began developing industry. And they were very, very successful. They were there for about 80 years. And so they were there, they're developing this industry, things are going well, they're actually improving the economy and so on, but the Irish Catholics were stirred up by the Jesuits. Why? Because the Pope, it is said, according to J.A. Wiley, the Pope declared that Protestant heretics could not own land in Ireland. And so the Jesuits stirred up the Irish Catholics, made them angry, and basically sent them out as a bloody mob to mass murder the English Protestants in Northern Ireland. And here you're seeing, this is a, uh, an illustration that was done from that era. And it says, the priests and Jesuits anoint the rebels with their sacrament of unction before they go to murder and rob, assuring them that their meritorious service, if they be killed, uh, he shall o'erleap purgatory and go to heaven immediately. Wow. In other words, the Jesuits now promising for going out and mass murdering the Protestants, don't worry, you get to skip purgatory and you'll go straight to heaven. This is how you're gonna be rewarded. Now I talked about last night, brethren, how the Catholic Church in Rwanda was behind the Rwanda genocide in 1994. How Catholic priests planned and carried out the Rwanda genocide. If you study World War II, not only will you find Jesuits behind Hitler and the Nazis, you'll find them working with the Croatian Eustache. Catholic priests took off their priest robe, put on Eustache uniforms, and went out and mass murdered the Orthodox Serbs. This is all a matter of history. So these things are not just something that happened hundreds of years ago that nobody has to be concerned about anymore. The crimes of Rome have continued into modern times. And now that we're seeing Rome joined with Islam, you can go see the Pope bringing in Muslim Imams into the Vatican to pray Islamic prayers, Islam that's driven by the spirit of Antichrist because they openly deny that Jesus is the Son of God. And now you've got two systems there. I mean, we could talk about, I'll talk more about Islam tomorrow, but Islam, guilty of mass murdering Christians throughout the 20th century, up into modern times. 
Rome murdering Christians throughout history up into modern times. And these two powers are working together. Yeah. Working together. All right. So the Irish Rebellion of 1641. Here, I wanted to show you this real quick. I was talking to Mike about this article earlier. This is from the Jesuits America Magazine. Their America Magazine is called the Jesuit Review. Out of, uh, and it's a Jesuit magazine, very openly. And they've got an article there they published a few years ago. The headline, Repeal the Second Amendment. Repeal the Second Amendment. When you had all this stuff going on with the Parkland students running and calling for changes and everything, there was a Jesuit priest who retweeted that article yeah. here just a short time ago. Repeal the Second Amendment. In the Irish Rebellion, I'm going to read the description here. This is from one of the illustrations from that time. It says, uh, quote, English Protestants stripped naked and turned into the mountains in the frost and snow, whereof many hundreds are perished to death and many lying dead in ditches and swages upbraided them, saying, now are ye wild as well as we. Okay, because apparently the, uh, the Catholics were jealous of the success of the Protestants and so uh, wanted to, I mean, literally went in there, not only murdered them, but then stripped them naked and drove them out into the wilderness, into the woods. And many of them perished. The numbers have been debated. At the time, it was said 100 to 150,000 English Protestants were mass murdered. Through various means. Here you have another scene where parents are being tied up in the chairs of their home and their children are being roasted alive over a fire. This is one of the accounts that was said to have taken place during the Irish Rebellion. You have online, you can find there's some 19,000 pages of testimony given by the Protestants at that time, those who survived for what happened. Okay, so as a result, Cromwell, that, that event, that event, the Irish Rebellion, as well as the oppressive theological impositions of Charles I, is all said to have been what was behind the English Civil War. Because Charles was king when this happened. And they, believed, they held him responsible for the massacre of their fellow English Protestants, that he had a responsibility to protect them, and he did not do so. And, of course, they believed he was conspiring with Rome. It was almost like what went on with Benghazi. Remember Benghazi? Yeah. U.S. citizens were murdered, and everybody's looking at the Obama administration and Hillary and saying, why didn't you protect our people? Right. Yeah. Okay? Why? Well, because many people believe Obama was a closet Muslim. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's why he wouldn't protect Americans against these Muslim jihadis who came to kill him. You see, you had the same, you had a similar dynamic going on with King Charles I. They didn't trust him. And so this, this and other issues led to the English Civil War. And so Cromwell becomes Lord Protector. They overthrow Charles I. He's condemned as a traitor, and they cut his head off. Okay? So, uh, but Cromwell, what did Cromwell say? It's important to understand Cromwell was a God-fearing, Christian, Bible-believing man. I've watched documentaries on this. Even his enemies, when they want to mock him, they'll say, well, you know, Cromwell wasn't very well-read, wasn't a very educated man. And they say, you know, the only book he really knew was the Bible. That was the only book he knew. He just wasn't a very sophisticated guy. But here was a man who had no military experience whatsoever. He'd never served in the military. And he raised up an army and he said, at first when they, they tried to resist the king, they weren't very successful, these other lords. And he, he was watching what was going on. And uh, he realized very quickly they were not gonna prevail if they were going down the course they had chosen. And so he said, I'm gonna raise up an army of men who have the fear of God before their eyes, men who bring some conscience to what they do. He said, give me such an army and I promise you they will not be beaten because Cromwell believed God's promises. He believed what God had said to Joshua, that no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Only be careful to keep my commands. That's what the Lord told Joshua. 
He said, you fear the Lord, and he will deliver you from the hands of all your enemies. And Cromwell and his Puritan army, they fought many battles. They were undefeated. They never lost a battle. Never lost a battle, brethren. And they were facing very experienced soldiers, but it didn't matter. They went into battle singing psalms and hymns and praise to God. Why? Because that's what they read the armies of Israel doing in the scripture. And they trusted the Lord. Okay, they believed God's promises. Now, this is one of my favorite things. I actually have a copy of this. This is called the Soldier's Pocket Bible. The Soldier's Pocket Bible. And it's said to be Cromwell's Soldier's Pocket Bible. And it's a series of scriptures from the Old and New Testament that pertain to being a soldier. And it is said that this was kept inside the, uh, the breast uh, pocket of Cromwell's men. Okay, and they all carried their soldier's pocket, uh, pocket Bible. All right? So now Cromwell, he passes on. Then you get King Charles II. They have the protectorate falls apart for a time. They bring back the monarchy. Uh, I mean, the men who served in Cromwell's army, for those who don't know, men like John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, the very famous Christian book, novel, Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan served in Cromwell's army. Uh, John Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, the great Puritan writer Milton, served in Cromwell's army and in his government. I mean, this was really an amazing company of men who were all together. Uh, and Milton even called Cromwell our chief of men, he said, uh, because of his boldness as the servant of the Lord and that he was unashamed of the gospel, but he was also considered one of the pioneers of toleration because he did not believe Christians should persecute each other over religious opinions, over arguing about baptism and communion and things like this. He did not believe Christians should be harming each other over those issues. Okay, so that was his big contribution. So Cromwell dies, they get King Charles II, then eventually they get King James II, and the administration of James II leads to the glorious revolution of 1688. Now what happened with James II is very, very important. James II was a Catholic monarch. He was the last Catholic monarch on the throne of England. Why? Because he went to disarm the Protestants in England. That's why. He went to take away their guns. Okay? The last Catholic monarch. And what had happened was, the reason the Irish rebellion is so important, and all these other massacres, these were the things that English Protestants had been watching now for more than a hundred years. All this persecution, mass murder, slaughter, everything else. Now, you have James II in uh, 1688. And James passed an edict of toleration. He was also a tool of the Jesuits. Now, what they had in England, they had laws that required that Protestant Christians be in positions of power in government and in the universities, etc., so James, he passes an edict of toleration in which he says, well, nobody's going to be hindered based upon what they believe. Okay, we're hearing a lot about tolerance in our society today, aren't we? People don't realize this is a Jesuit doctrine that goes back hundreds of years. And uh, our forefathers, men like J.A. Wiley and J.C. Ryle, those two in particular, wrote about this in the 19th century. And they said, while it, it was presented in such a way, they said it was a, uh, what was it? A sweetened cup laced with poison. A treacherous gift, they said. This idea of toleration. When people first heard it, they thought, oh, toleration, that sounds great. That, yeah, okay, all right. Then they saw what James did with it. He started having Protestants removed from positions of power and authority, and he would replace them with Catholics. Okay, And then whenever anybody said to him, well, why are you getting rid of this guy who's a Protestant? He would say, well, because we have to be tolerant of everyone. So he was using it as a weapon to move Protestants out of power. Then he decided to start disarming the Protestant population, taking their arms from them, which he did. 
Meanwhile, he kept arms in the hands of all the Catholics. So the Protestants are watching this happen, and they're thinking, okay, this is going to end up like the Irish Rebellion 50 years ago. We're going to end up being mass murdered by all these Catholics. Okay, and the Jesuits are working with James. They're going to stir up a frenzied mob to come after us any day. So what they did was they wrote letters to William, a great leader named William of Orange, and his wife Mary. Mary was an heir to the throne. And so they wrote letters to William and Mary who were both Protestants. And William was a great Protestant military leader as well. They wrote letters to them and they said, listen, James has betrayed us. He's setting us up. We know what he's doing. Bring your army and invade England and we will support you, not him. Because we're not going to fight for him. Then what happened was, as William's army is approaching, James is trying to get these Protestants to serve with him and they won't do it. They all excused themselves, came up with excuses, whatever, but he realized the people had turned on him because England was a majority Protestant country at that time. So William and Mary come in with their army and James ends up having to flee, okay? Because nobody would fight for him. He had to flee his own kingdom. So William and Mary come in and you had what is called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. And this is also why we have the College of William and Mary here in our country today. It's a memorial of these events. Remember that every time, whenever somebody mentions the College of William and Mary, think the right to bear arms. Why? Because as a direct result of these events, the Protestants said to William and Mary, we want a declaration of our rights and we want those rights to include the right to bear arms. Because we do not want to be sitting in our homes waiting for some violent, bloody Jesuit mob to come kick down our doors and murder us and our families. The right to bear arms was not brought about for hunting or sporting events or some nameless, faceless idea of tyranny. It was, it, there were specific things that happened. And I think this history is very, very important because if you look at the people who are manipulating our government right now, they have links all the way back to the same people who ran the Inquisition. These are the same people who, and we don't have time, I've got a, an audio CD out there called uh, The Jesuits and Marxism, Weapon of the Counter-Reformation. The Jesuits developed the principles of Marxism in the 19th century with Karl Marx, okay? In fact, they were kicked out of Germany by Otto von Bismarck, who was a great Protestant leader. He drove them out of Germany specifically because he believed they were working with Karl Marx. They were in cahoots with Marx to stir up all these socialist revolutions across Europe, and Germany was one of them. Von Bismarck was kind of like Ronald Reagan in his, back in the 19th century. He resisted the socialists, kept them down, and that's an interesting history. I'm going to talk more about it tomorrow. But the important thing here is the English Bill of Rights of 1689, a hundred years later, approximately, in a modified form, this becomes our American Bill of Rights. Okay? So this was the reason why our forefathers were not willing to surrender arms in early America. They knew the history. And this was, at the time, in our colonies, it was a declared right. It was written down. It was law, because it extended to the American colonies as well. All right. Wow. I'm running out of time, aren't I? <laughs> okay. i got to move very, very quickly. All right. Okay. Let's talk about something. I'm going to talk to you now about some things that, that influence our American worldview. Influence are, that I think are very, very powerful historically. The Declaration of Arbroath from 1320, the Scottish Lords. This declaration you find in a book that I recommend called The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates, which is called, quote, a proper resistance to tyranny and a repudiation of unlimited obedience to civil government. Very important that we understand this is a Christian teaching, brethren. The idea of unlimited obedience, our Christian forefathers, 
our, our Bible-believing Christian forefathers, none of them believe that. None of them believe that we check our brain at the door and just do whatever we're told. We serve God first and foremost. But in the declaration of Arbroath, the Scottish lords said, for so long as a hundred of us are alive, we will yield in no least way to English rule. It is in truth, not for glory, nor for wealth, nor honors, but only and alone we fight for freedom, which no good man surrenders, but with his life. Freedom, which no good man surrenders, but with his life. Now, our next documentary is called The True Christian History of America. We're, we're gonna talk about these things. And I had an opportunity to interview pastor, he's a pastor, Matthew J. Truella, who wrote this book, Doctor and Lesser Magistrates. I interviewed him for the film, and I asked him when I saw this phrase, uh, freedom which no good man surrenders but with his life. And I said to him, did that influence Patrick Henry, who said, give me liberty or give me death? Liberty or death? And he said, absolutely. Okay, absolutely, because it came centuries earlier and would have been part of our English-speaking Christian heritage. All right, Patrick Henry, his famous speech. Oh, let me read through this. There's a, there's a number of passages I wanted to read. Here's, here's what Henry says, because I think this is powerful for us today, brethren. He said, quote, Should I keep back my opinions at such a time, through fear of giving offense, I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country and of an act of disloyalty toward the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. Notice, he's drawing a contrast between the power of heaven and that of earthly kings. He said, quote, there is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, we must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that has left us. Henry understood, as our Puritan forefathers did, if you read the Christian soldier's ma uh, manual, they all made it very clear. The horse is prepared for battle, but victory comes from the Lord. Amen. That when we face our enemies, it will not be by our skill alone that we'll be able to prevail, only with the help of God. That is what they believed. Henry said, Quote, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable and let it come. I repeat it, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry peace, peace, but there is no peace. Notice he's quoting the scripture. The Bible does not call us to accept a false peace, brethren. We know that. Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. He says, the war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Okay, he says, our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? Is life so dear or peace so sweet? as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. That speech, we know the phrase liberty or death, but many of us don't realize how many references to God and the authority of heaven versus that of earthly kings Patrick Henry made reference to. By the way, I believe Henry was a Bible-believing Christian man. If you study him, in fact, there's a beautiful story told about him where one of his neighbors came upon him and he was reading a Bible. And, uh, and he was talking about how he felt he had neglected the scriptures for too many years. And he was glad that he had time later in life to reflect upon the word of God. He was even offended. He wrote a letter uh, to his daughter, because somebody had suggested he was a deist. And he was actually offended at the idea that anybody would think he was a deist. And what he did now, rather than complain against other people, this I found so very endearing. 
He said, the reason people are saying this about me, he said, is because I haven't done enough of a good job to make it clear that I'm a Christian. Okay, he took accountability for it, which I found so powerful. And I'm paraphrasing these things, just so we know. All right. This is on the idea of false peace. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 9. Uh, when Jehu approached Joram, uh, it says, And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. God does not call us to embrace a false peace. All right, so Patrick Henry gave his speech, and less than a month later, this led to the battles of Lexington and Concord, April 19th, 1775. You have the Concord Bridge uh, that talks about from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, where he says, here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. But what was the battles of Lexington and Concord? That was literally where the Redcoats came to confiscate arms from our American forefathers. And they were determined that they were not going to surrender their arms. And so they fought back and they kept their arms and that led to the conflict of the American Revolution. That's what led to the battles of the American Revolution. Um, if we had more time, I would talk more about the powder alarm. I'll tell you what, I'll talk about that tomorrow. I wanted to go over briefly. I just got a few more here. Well, the powder alarm, I'll tell you very quickly. The powder alarm, the reason this is important, because in this event, the British confiscated the gunpowder from a powder uh, storage unit there in Massachusetts, okay? And if you research this online, basically what they did, it was a backdoor method of arms control by taking the gunpowder away. Because without gunpowder, you couldn't use those muskets. And you've had people who have been making reference to this, like during the Obama administration, when they were buying up millions and millions of rounds of ammunition, trying to uh, basically diminish the ammunition supply in our country. It's why our forefathers believed not only do Americans need to have arms, but also the freedom to manufacture arms and ammunition without the government controlling it. That's essential, essential. Uh, I wanted to briefly talk about our Puritan forefathers believed not only in the right to bear arms, brethren, but the duty to bear arms. Massachusetts legislature in 1644 said, quote, all inhabitants are to have arms in their houses always ready, fixed for service. That was a, that was a law. They had a law that said that on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, you had to bring a musket with you to church. If you didn't, you had to pay a 12 pence fine. <laughs> Had to pay a fine, brethren. You didn't bring your gun. There'll be a table. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a few more. I got a few more slides here. This is from 1773 from a minister named Elijah Fish. And he wrote a work called The Art of War, Lawful and Necessary. Lawful and Necessary. And he said this, quote, The necessity for a Christian people to learn the art of war rises into view. The use of arms kept up and understood among Christian people is necessary and vastly important as a restraint or check on aspiring wicked rulers. Okay, he says, quote, for the best civil constitution in the world will not restrain such rulers whilst they have nothing to fear from the power of the people. Look at what's going on in Europe right now. They've disarmed almost all the countries in Europe except for Switzerland, and now the governments are just running roughshod over the people, giving their country away to all these foreign immigrants that they're bringing in, handing over their tax dollars. The people are objecting to it, and the socialist leaders don't care. They're doing whatever they want to do. Uh, in Nehemiah, what did Nehemiah say? Nehemiah there, 
Remember when they were rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem, they were being threatened by their enemies, and Nehemiah told them to take up arms. They, they all armed themselves. They set up watchmen with their trumpets, and then Nehemiah says, quote, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. He compelled them to stand ready and be ready to fight. Now, what's amazing about Nehemiah, I talk about this on my radio program, because they armed themselves and they stood ready, when their enemies saw that they were ready, they chose not to attack. They backed off. Okay? What's the saying? If you want peace, prepare for war. Prepare for war. All right, Exodus 15, 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Okay, just two more. Here's one from Tench Cox. Tench Cox, who was the Pennsylvania delegate to the Continental Congress. And Tench Cox said this, very powerful. He said, quote, Congress has no power to disarm the militia. Amen. Their swords and every terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of Americans. Amen. Think about that. Remember that, brethren, the original view. Because right now we're being told that Americans don't need rifles like the AR-15. Well, you don't need that kind of a rifle. That's a weapon of war. Our forefathers believed no. Every terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of Americans. Because they believe we the people are the last line of defense, not only against tyranny and oppression from within, but also invasion from without. Why? Because the military is under the control of the government. Remember Benghazi. If the government tells the military to stand down, what happens? They're not going to be there to defend Americans. Okay? They're, 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 we have a, a multi-billion dollar Air Force. Where were they on 9-11 when planes were flying into the World Trade Center? There was no military protection. You see what I'm saying? So our four, and that's nothing against our military. I come from a military family, but the military is trained to follow orders. So our forefathers believed that what is best for our society is for every man to be armed and ready. Thomas Jefferson said, no freeman shall ever be debarred the use of arms. It's very clear. All right, now I wanted to close with this. Uh, an admonition from Elijah Fish, 1773, from the sermon we talked about earlier. He said, quote, finally, my young brethren, I wish you may be good soldiers in the use of arms for your king and country, but above all, that you may be reminded of being good soldiers under King Jesus. Fighting against all spiritual enemies with spiritual arms for an eternal crown. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thanks, you guys. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Let me pull you to start getting okay. microphones off here. And are we going to take a break? Yeah, we're going to take a five-minute break while we uh, kind of reset everything here. And uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 tells you, There is no new thing under the sun. The thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. And he has just given you all the things that hath been. And the devil doesn't have new ideas. He's going to regurgitate the old ones. Put them into effect. Very powerful information here. I appreciate Chris. Appreciate the work that he's done. Uh, you are at liberty. Take a few minutes to break. Brother Red's going to come up here. We're going to re-mic him, reset the podium and everything like that. And we'll call you back in in a few minutes. Thank you.
I'll say bless the Lord first. How about that? There you that? go. Amen. You have water up here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Five minutes is up. Let's get it going. Thank you. I sure appreciate it, buddy. Sure do. There's a little fan on here. You can turn it off. The fan? Turn it off. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time and ask God to move through the next speaker. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for what we heard tonight. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you're calling us to live in these days, Lord. Supply us, Lord, with every need that we have. We pray that you'd bless for the Reg, anoint him with power from on high, help him to preach, Lord, without apology to any one of us here. Lord, use him for your kingdom and your glory's sake. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. And Brother Red Kelly, you come to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Brother Mike. God bless you. Take your Bibles to the book of Genesis. The Bible to the book of Genesis. Thank you for letting us be here. I had an unusual situation occur on the way up here today. It was raining, and I come up behind this truck, and this lady fell out of the truck on the right of way. And uh, so anyway, another guy stopped and I stopped. He said, listen, I'll take care of her. You run and catch this guy because he just kept trucking. So I finally caught him, got him stopped. And I, said, and I got him up. I said, hey, man, don't you realize your wife fell out of the truck? He said, well, thank goodness. I thought I'd went deaf. <laughs> well, my, amen. Glad to be here. I didn't know if he was going to get that or not. It, it took a little while to catch on there. Amen. You heard about that. I, I was up, you, know, you ever go to the hospital? I went to the hospital one day. I got out of my truck and uh, headed up through there. And, and uh, this elderly lady, a little, you know, little white-headed lady looking over the steering wheel like this, you know. And she was, there was a parking spot. And how many knows they're hard to get in with a Cadillac? I can't hardly get a Volkswagen in or something. But she had a big old beautiful Cadillac. And she's trying to put that thing in the parking spot. And she held up there and she was looking at it. And I was walking up there, watching a little bit. And all of a sudden, here comes this blonde, I mean, this, I mean, you know, bombshell blonde in a little bitty old sports car, like a spider or something like that. What are they, one of them cars? She goes, zoom, yellow, little yellow car, zoom, whips right in front of her and takes this parking spot. Gets out, looks at that elderly lady in the Cadillac, says, that's what you could do when you're young and beautiful. Boy, I thought, ooh. I walked up about it, and all of a sudden I turned and heard this humongous boom crash car. And this elderly lady had taken her Cadillac and just rammed her sports car with it. Rode down the window and said, that's what you can do when you're old and rich. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hey, Brother Chris, man, thank you. Amen. Woo! Man, that's right. That was good. Boy, I tell you what, I, I'm sitting there thinking... Every American ought to be forced to listen to that. Yeah. Every American ought to be forced. And I, I want to tell you, I thank God for men who will dig deep and I mean get, to, get it nailed down and get it right and, uh, and not be afraid of it. And I, I appreciate so much your stand on Catholicism. It's the curse of the world. Amen. Yeah. Besides the Islam. But anyway, uh, you got your Bibles to Genesis there. Chapter, uh, let's go to chapter 2. We'll just go to chapter one, that'll be fine, and we'll try to keep trucking here. But then, I want to say uh, just again, and not trying to be flowery or nothing like that, but I so appreciate Brother Mike Hoggard and uh, Bethel Church and this work here. And uh, I'm telling you something, God's using this work. 
And I want to encourage you to know that, that uh, people are being helped. God is being glorified. And I am so thankful that I get the chance just to kind of be around it, be involved with it. You know, that's a blast. It's a blessing. And I'm telling you something, little is much when God is in it. But it ain't little. It, it's reaching out there. And, and Brother Mike has had a tremendous impact on my life. But just seemed like, I don't know, all those years ago when God uh, uh, caused us to meet together. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of great things that's come through that. And I so appreciate it. Well, Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26. I'm just going to use this for a text tonight. And uh, let's read there in verse number. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. If you don't mind, just one more time. Stretch just a little bit. And verse number 26 of chapter 1. Everybody there say amen. amen. And God said... Let us make man in our image. That is an astounding statement. Yeah. To think tonight that as ugly as I am, I made the image of God. Yeah. Every person you've ever looked at, I don't care what, how high, how tall or short or big around or skinny or what color they were, God made man in his image. Yeah. Now that means something and that makes a difference and it has ramifications. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and all the earth. Over every creeping thing that creepeth, creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he then. Let's pray. Father, tonight help us to preach the gospel. Help us to preach the word of God. Help us to preach the whole counsel of God, and especially, Lord, help us to rightly divide the word of truth. And I pray, God, that you'll guard me from saying anything that I ought not say, but I pray you'll give me unction and Holy Ghost power and clearness of thought and mind to say what ought to be said. And I pray use this, Lord, for your glory's sake and for the freedom of this nation. Thank you, Lord, for letting me be here tonight. Thank you for this church, this ministry, these people. Lord, I pray bless them, Heavenly Father. I mean, pour the bucket out upon them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. Um, Mike mentioned to me here a while back about this whole thing. He said, Reggie, he said, I, I'd kind of like to have this conference centered on the thought of the Second Amendment and the Bible. The Second Amendment and the Bible. Uh, about a week and a half ago or so, or maybe two weeks ago now, time gets away from me. I was in Ohio preaching a revival meeting. And uh, one day, uh, my wife was with me, which was a great joy. And uh, she was with me. And so the pastor and his wife and his daddy and his wife, I told them, I said, we, we was going to all go get something to eat one day. They want to take us down to an Amish a sandwich shop and bakery down there in the country, real pretty country. And we went down there. So anyway, in the back seat, his wife, the, the pastor's mother was back there in the back seat. And if I remember correctly, it was, it was her said this. She said, you've got a gun in the floorboard. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, I got one on my left side of my arm, and I got one on the right side of my arm. That's a, that's a rifle. That, these are pistols. And she said, is it loaded? I said, it wouldn't be worth a dime unloaded. I said, watch your feet. Don't cock it with your foot, moving your foot around. It was a Marlin 3030 rifle. And I like those. Now, if I get in a fight, you just let me have my 3030 lever action. You may not think I can swing that thing, but I'll tell you, I'll, 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 I'll get you. And while you're trying to figure yours out. But that's the, that's the gun I started out with when I was a kid. First gun I ever bought was a, Mar was a Winchester 3030 pre-64 model. I was driving on down the road and I just said simply be careful. But yeah, yeah, it's a gun and it is loaded, yes. Then I began to learn something about the state of Ohio. That I was illegal and if I were stopped I could be thrown into jail. For having a loaded gun in my truck. Now, that astounds me yet. Now I, that's what they told me. I haven't went and checked Ohio laws. But I figured they knew what they were talking about. They're Bible believing people. They're pro second amendment people. They're country people. They said Reggie if you were to get stopped and picked up. And this rifle and those pistols. And you don't have. And said do you have concealed carry? No I don't. And I know this is going live broadcast. I don't believe in concealed carry. The, the second amendment does not say. If I have a concealed carry permit. I can be armed. And uh, they said you could be, you, they said they might let you go on back to Missouri, but they might, they could throw you in jail and they could, they, they could prosecute you. I said, you've got to be kidding me in the state of Ohio that if I've got a loaded 30-30 rifle, 
that I can be stopped, that that's against the law? I said, I've had that all my life. Now, we're looking tonight, and so, you know, everybody knows that knows me, I'm a big pro-Second Amendment guy. Not just the Second Amendment, all of them. I'm, I'm for all of them, but I'm like the man said, well, let go, or Brother Mike, one or the other. The other nine, uh, uh, the, uh, the others are protected by the Second Amendment. Now, I want to, so, but when Brother Mike said, Reggie, I want to uh, have a Second Amendment in the Bible, I, I got to thinking, because I'm always kind of, you know, come out of the, come out of the shoot bucket. But I got to thinking, and I took some time. I spent some time alone with the Lord and got alone and about this thing, and God began to just kind of quiet me down. And this message may be different than most of the messages you hear me preach. But God kind of quieted me down and said, Reggie, why are you a Second Amendment supporter? Reggie, shouldn't you base all of your belief and practice out of the Word of God? Shouldn't it be the root and source of your belief and practice? And Reggie, your belief about the Second Amendment, is it based on the Bible or is it just Americanism and constitutionalism? But is it rooted in the Bible? And so I begin to study that and look at that pretty hard. I'm not going to say anything tonight that you've, not, that you've not heard before probably. I just hope I can reinforce what you already believe. But the basis, and I'm going to do like the old boy said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to tell you what I said. All right, that's what they claim that makes a good, for a good message. I don't know whether it does or not. Most of the time when I get done, I don't know what I said. But anyway, the basis of the entire Bill of Rights was clearly to state that we have God-given rights given to man by their Creator, by their Redeemer, and not by the state. But it was to articulate them and set them forth. It was clearly to state and articulate limitations. Uh, to the constitutional government created by the document. It was given to distinguish between personal defense and national defense. And this is a major area about the Second Amendment and, of course, an area of conflict and di disagreement. It was also given to as a reflection of the authority of God concerning life and property. And this is where I want to go with this. The, our Constitution, as they mentioned, and, and, and I'll just maybe build a little bit on what he said a while ago. The, uh, endowed by our creator, that man was created, that indicates a God, and of course they assume that you understood the Bible, that Jesus Christ, the creator. So tonight I want to preach a message entitled, The Source of the Second Amendment. The Source of the Second Amendment. Why does Reg Kelly, or why do you believe, or would fight for, or defend the Second Amendment? The Second Amendment, I know and have found in studying, and uh, you know, just reinforced, that the Second Amendment is rooted in this book tonight. It is rooted in this book. It sprung out of this, just as, uh, just as a corn plant would spring out of the ground, the Second Amendment sprung out of the Bible. And that's what I want to get us tonight, because when it comes down to crunch time, which I may see, or my grandchildren may see, we're going to have to stand before God and say we had a biblical basis for what we believed and what we practiced. The truth, this truth is not only based upon just the many verses and subjects uh, of the Bible about this, and by the way, of arms, when the Bible talks about swords and bows and slings and harbingers, I guess that's how you pronounce that word, and uh, their use individually or collectively, personally or by an army, the Bible, it's not just based upon the fact that there's accounts in Scripture of men using arms. It goes deeper than that, and this is what it's done. Uh, Mike, I'm telling you, God just helped me on this. But I saw something I never saw before because I've always looked at it from this perspective. I've got a right to defend my person. I've got a right to defend my family. I have a right to defend my property. Now, but where did that come from and how is it embedded and how is it rooted into the Bible? But in the, there's a deeper principle about the Second Amendment and it has to do with what we look at, the very word life itself. God is a God of life. In fact, he gives us, when we are saved, he gives us life and life more abundantly. He gives us eternal life and uh, he is a God of life. We're created by this God of life, not a God of death, but a God of life. And we're created in his image. And embedded in that creation is the whole idea about the value of life. Now, it's interesting to me today that uh, the same crowd that wants to abort babies is the same crowd that wants to take away your right to bear arms. That's not, that's not, an, uh, uh, that's not just an a, a, a accident. There's something in that. But it's the deeper principle of life, the value of life, the deeper principle of the source of life itself, 
and the deeper principle of the sacredness of life. This second amendment is embedded and rooted in the principle of being created by God in his image and that value of life and the value of property. Now, as we said there a while ago, that man is created in the image of God. The second amendment is also rooted in this. Our forefathers understood, they, they read the Bible, they knew, they knew the Bible so much better. And by the way, let me just say something tonight. You agree with this, fine. If you don't, that's fine too. I do not go along with all this talk about the founding fathers being a bunch of pagan atheists and deists. You cannot have the founding documents that we have by a bunch of men who are deists. Deism is stupid, crazy stuff, and there never was anything godly ever came out of it. Now, there were some ungodly men, of course, involved, but the, but the bulk of them, by the way, he talking about Patrick Henry and these men, and, and I've done some studying, and you know, I realize but there's a rewriting of history about these men's faith, and I'm not going to buy into that garbage, and I'm seeing even Christian men who are buying into this deal that our founding fathers were just a bunch of deists, and they, hey, they really didn't know Jesus Christ, and they really didn't base it in the Bible. Well, that's garbage. If you ever go to Washington, D.C. and take a real tour, you will see the biblical the Bible, is in, in, it's in the granite. It's carved in the granite. And I mean, the, and the, you don't get documents like we have, and you don't get the outspringing of these documents that's so supportive of and embracing of Christianity without those men having some beliefs. Now, it's strange to me that everybody wants to go after Benjamin Franklin. And I realize there's arguments about it. And, and I don't know, you know, who knows who wrote what. But I do know this, that Benjamin Franklin's the man who said that if a sparrow can't fall right. without the knowledge of God, and I'm not going to quote it exactly right, but how can we supposed to raise up a government and a new country without the aid of his assistance? Right. And he said, I hear for a move that we have prayer every day. Now, you know, a deist just isn't going to go one wanting to pray all the time to God and for help, amen? I mean, I don't like that kind of talk. And so I want to lay that as a foundation that, by and large, our founding fathers were at least biblically based men. They may have had some various and did have various ideas about so forth. But I'm not buying into this. I'm not going to let the revisionists rewrite history for me. There's too much evidence of a Christian influence in the founding of this nation. So the Second Amendment is rooted in some biblical truth. Well, what are those biblical truths? If you'll just think this through, our founding fathers understood the doctrine of the fall of man. They understood the doctrine of the fall of man. You wouldn't need a Second Amendment. You wouldn't think about a Second if you didn't understand the fall of man. Secondly, they understood the biblical doctrine of the curse. The curse that came with the fall. Man fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, and as a result of that sin and disobedience, he was put out from the presence of God. He was put under the curse of sin, and death came upon him. And what's the first thing that happened after the, out of the gate? Was Cain killed Abel. Amen. All right. So now you've got this setup of, of the fall. So, in other words, the reason... That the second amendment is needed is because they believed and knew and understood what modernists do not understand. You see, your modern people are teaching, and even this is in a lot of churches now. You see, salvation is by grace through faith. Amen. It's not of ourselves, not of works, lest we should, and by, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. They believe thirdly, not just in the fall of man or the curse, but they believed in the total depravity of man. You know what that means? Man, man's heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things, and who can know it? Man does not have a little spark of goodness fluttering down inside, waiting for the fan of a right environment to come and burst him into a wonderful person. No, every, one, every stinking, nasty one of us will do our worst if we are not restrained either by the hand of the law or by the grace of God in our hearts. We will kill people. Can I tell you something? I, you say, Reggie, you're going to admit this? I have had thoughts in my head of putting somebody out. Amen. You say, Reggie, what restrained you? <laughs> well, the, I don't want to spend my life in a pen. <laughs> Secondly, I don't want to have that before Almighty God. Amen. And thirdly, I have, I, believe it or not, the love of God is shed and brought in my heart. And I don't want to kill nobody. I want to kill nobody. And I'm telling you, the NRA and the Second Amendment people, we don't want to kill people. 
And the reason we bear arms is because we don't want anybody else to get killed. But you have to understand that the Second Amendment is rooted and grounded in the truth that man fell into sin. He received the curse. And by the curse, and through that, and through that fall and that curse, he's depraved. And he'll kill people and steal from people and rape people, murder people. He'll do terrible things. And now there's a, so now we have to have something to come against that, something to counter that. Yeah. Now, the Second Amendment is also rooted in the biblical truth and principle of love. How can you claim to love your spouse and your children if you will not protect them? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I don't tell you a bunch of snowflake wimps in this country says, well, I'm going to hand in my AR-15 and all our ammo. You're a stinking coward, and you, your real problem is you don't love nobody. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. If you loved your wife and you loved your children, you would protect them with your very life. Christ, hey, Christ, Christ has a church. He loved the church and gave his life for it. He laid down his life for the church so that the murderer, the devil, couldn't take us to hell and murder us spiritually forever. I'm telling you tonight. The Second Amendment is not just rooted and grounded in the depravity, the curse, the fall. It's rooted in the love of God. Amen. Anybody wouldn't defend their own children, they don't love their own children. Let me tell you something. I've got a stinking cat or two around my farm. If they have kittens, you don't want to mess with them. That mama cat will go, and she'll claw your eyes out if you start messing with her kittens. Amen. I mean, a, a groundhog's got more sense than most Americans got. A groundhog will protect. That's called the. They, they call it nature's. The, the, somebody help me. Nature's God and help me. Yeah, but I'm talking about in our Constitution. What's it say? Declaration. The, the laws of nature and nature's God. The laws of nature is natural affection. Any kind of everything God created wants to protect its own. Unless it's perverted like a tomcat. That's why the old timers used to call some old uh, whore chaser and some woman chaser that didn't care about nobody a tomcat. Because he wouldn't care for his kids after he begat them. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, our forefathers are smart people. I don't care what you're saying. The reason it was because they had a Bible. Now, the most reprobate lowlife that would not be prepared and willing to defend and protect his family... I'm telling you, said ought not be considered even a citizen of this nation. That's low down. When you won't protect your, and you want to say, well, I don't want to have arms. I don't want to protect. I want to tell you right now, are you telling me, sir, that somebody break into your home and says, I'm going to rape your wife. You're going to stand back and go, please don't do that. Amen. Your wife's screaming for help. You say, honey, are you joking me? Are you nuts? You're a reprobate. Amen. Your mind's flipped upside down. Amen. You're telling me that somebody breaks in and they're going to kill your children, slit their pull the butt, put your knife out, grabs your child by the head, the hair jerks his head back, puts the knife to his throat, and you're going to say, I don't believe in arms. Yeah. On. That's craziness. Amen. That's idiocy. Amen. What it really is is what the Bible calls reprobate. Yeah. You have believed a lie so long that your, that your whole mind is flipped upside down. You think right's wrong and wrong's right now. Amen. Even animals, as I said, have that natural law. The second minute further is rooted in biblical responsibility. The Bible said if a man provide not for his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's just not talking about putting cornbread and beans on the table. That's talking about providing protection, providing shelter. Providing uh, defense, providing whatever it might be. You're to provide for them. And part of your provision is to provide protection for your family. Amen. I'm telling you right now. Let me say to you this again. It is rooted in biblical principles. And I'll run through them again. Biblical principles of the curse, the fall, the depravity of man, the responsibility of man, and in the, in, in the biblical of love, that if you love people, if you love the truth, if you love righteousness, you either, you either love the Lord, hate evil, you want to defend your own family. Amen. Second Amendment is also, as I said, rooted in the biblical truth of natural law. And like I told you, I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to tell you what it said. Any government, now listen to me, any government not based upon biblical truth, 
which socialism is a governmental system that is not based upon biblical truth, communism, and by the way, just any old tyrant, and I don't care what they name their government, if they're not based upon biblical truth, they will not have a value for human life nor a sacredness of human life. That's why communism, I don't know if you've ever read the article, the, story, the little deal about communism kills. Communism has killed way more than Hitler ever killed. I mean, you know, and you look at Mao Zedong, what, 100, 200 million of his own people killed? Stalin killed, what was it? 60 million people of his own people? Everybody talking about the six, six million or whatever it was and that Hitler was responsible for, and that's horrible, it's terrible, but the truth about it is communism, which is a, by the way, I don't, I've never understood, you know, it's all right. They're, 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 these, these little snowflakes and infantiles going around, they're all against, uh, they're all against uh, Hitler. But they never say nothing wrong about Marx or Stalin or Lenin. You ever notice that? Yeah. They never got anything bad to say about that. And yet, what did Hitler call his government? Socialism. Yeah. Any government not based upon biblical truth will not have the value of human life. So, but why? Because they don't believe the Bible. Right. Man is not created in the image of God. If there's no God or there's no man's not creating the image of God, then there's no value of life. That's why we have the abortion situation because we've abandoned the whole idea. It's not an accident that we brought evolution into our system, in our schools, in our nation, and then came abortion. Right, man. It's not an accident because we devalued life. We got away from that biblical principle that our four founding forefathers put in place. And the whole idea of the Second Amendment is that life is so valuable. That's why Patrick Henry said what he said. Life is so valuable that it is worth defending, it's worth fighting for, it's worth dying for, and, and protecting those around you. And so this absence of a correct view and a correct biblical understanding from the scriptures will result in the devaluing of life and the devaluing of liberty and personal property and result in personal theft of property and governmental theft of property and then personal Death and governmental death because they devalue the purpose of life. Now, let me tell you where your sodomite thing's moving to. I don't call them gays. They're sodomites. That's what the Bible calls them. They don't like to be called that, and I like to call them that just to make them mad. i am tell you right now, I, I, you show me the Bible where God sent an evangelist to a bunch of sodomites. He didn't. When he sent them down there to Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent them down there to destroy that place. Get what saved people was out of there. And, and kill the rest of them. Let me tell you why God doesn't send evangelists out. So you say, oh, don't you believe they can be saved? I believe, it, yes, I, nothing's impossible to God. But let me tell you about 99.9% .9 of sodomites, they're a reprobate mind, they're gone. He gave them over and he gave them up. Now, the sodomite culture is out to destroy biblical Christianity in America. Let me get back on track. When a man or any person, as far as that goes, tells me that they do not support the God-given right to bear arms and defend and protect those under their care, I know something about that person. Number one, they do not value life or they would never say such a thing. Amen. You cannot be against the Second Amendment and value life. Second of all, they do not love. Amen. You'll notice I'm repeating myself. You cannot say that you love your family or love your neighbor if you won't do something when he's an act of violence is perpetrated upon them. Amen. Thirdly, I know something about that person who's against the Second Amendment. They are cowards. Yeah. And they are surrendered their freedoms and they've surrendered their liberty. They're cowards. They have for forfeited their liberty and freedom thir further. When they, when, the moment that you say you don't like the Second Amendment, you think it ought to be repealed or done away with or altered some another, what you've done is forfeited your liberty and freedom. Fifthly, they've advanced the cause, those people who advance the cause of repealing or doing away with the Second Amendment, they are advancing crime in this country. Let me tell you why the schools have been had the shooting that they've had. It's because those people, they're, no, they're gun-free zones. You all know this stuff. It's all of news. But the fact of it is that this idea about that we shouldn't have guns in, in here is, act, act, is, is nothing but an enticement to a criminal. If I'm, if I'm riding down the road tonight with a, with a drug head criminal who's looking to bust into somebody's house to steal something so he can buy some more drugs, and he says, Reggie, I know that my car, I heard him preach, 
He doesn't believe in owning a gun. He's against the Second Amendment. Let's, let's get their house. When he says that he's against it, now what he has done, and thank God Mike don't believe that way, but what Mike has done, if he did that, he has promoted crime yeah. by saying, I have given up my God-given biblical right to, and I have surrendered my freedom and my, what's this, my value and the dignity of my life and my family. I have surrendered it to the criminals and I am advancing and enhancing criminal activity in my community. I'm telling you, I've been in Israel three times. I've been, been in the head of street there. And I was talking to, and, and you'll see these young people over there all going around. They'll have the machine guns on their strap, okay? I mean, I'm just telling you. And the girls have to go two years, I think, or two years, and the boys all have to go three years, mandatory. And all those young people that are in the military are packing an assault rifle on their shoulder. I don't care whether they're shopping. I don't care what they're doing. It's with them everywhere. I stopped one of them over one time, and I said, because I was noticing something. They're on Benny Houston Street. Kids, little bitty old two and five and seven year old kids, they were just running. I'll get back up on and get on the camera, okay? But they were, they were running around everywhere. And I said something to one of those, those soldiers. I said, don't you worry about these little kids getting hurt or somebody abducting. I mean, they're just running around here up and down the street. Not like you see here in America, I'm telling you now. And he said, no, we don't worry about it at all. I said, why? He said, if anybody touches one of them kids, they'd be dead in three seconds. He said, be, anybody touches one of the kids, they'll shoot him like a dog. He said, further, let me tell you something. He said, you got a billfold? I said, yeah, I got a billfold. He said, you can put that down right there. And come back five o'clock this evening, it'll be laying right there. Amen. Wow. I said, why? Because he said, anybody starts picking up, the, he's had it. Armed people stop crime. Amen. They stop crime. Unarmed people, and especially people who are against arms, promote crime, and by that, they become accessory to the crime. So the people who are saying that our schools should not have guns in them, or that a place of business should have a sign that says gun-free zone, those people are guilty of the murders that's happening inside. So, that makes Nancy Pelosi... That makes Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and all that liberal progressive crowd guilty of the murder of those children in this country. They're the ones who have caused it. By the way, not only by that, but by their teaching in the schools of America, yeah. the evolutionary process yeah. that we're animals and not, remember, not rooted in the Bible. Right. We are animals and not created in the image of God. And if we're just animals, what does it matter? If there's no creator, there is no judge. That's logic. Yeah. If there's no judge, I can do what I want to do. And it's the, by the way, is not Darwinian evolutionism the basis of it, the survival of the fittest? Right. Exactly. So I'm saying to you, for you to be against the Second Amendment... You are a promoter of crime, and you are guilty of crime. Yeah, you say, well, I didn't go and rob the bank. Yep, you sat sitting out there and had your hand on the steering wheel. Amen. You're just as guilty. They're criminals, partners in crime. I said, as I said, their mind is reprobate. And the anti-Second Amendment crowd are a danger to our country. The real culprits are not the NRA. The real culprits are not gun owners of America. They're not Bible-believing Christians, and they're not certainly not the millions of Americans who've got pistols and rifles and everything else in their homes. Amen. It's the godless crowd, because they're the ones promoting the wicked, godly, unconstitutional idea that this country needs to be dearmed. De de and by the way, let's just be honest about it. The whole idea of dearmament is, is to take away all of our freedoms. Amen. Those who promote those gun-free zones, teach evolution, promote lawlessness. And by the way, let me say something further. Those who are constantly promoting the idea that criminals should not be punished. Because sentence is not executed speedily, the hearts of men are set upon evil, the Bible said. You know what that means? That's why our forefathers said you have a right to a speedy trial. You don't drag this thing out for four years. You get this trial in there, get the evidence, get him before a jury of his peers. If he's guilty, punish him. And if he's not guilty, let him go. But don't be dragging this thing out. I'm saying to you this tonight on that, and on that issue, any laws or legislators or judges, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it to you tonight, what, one of the reasons people are not afraid to go do what they're doing, there's many factors to it, but one of them is 
They know nothing's going to happen to them. In fact, they're going to become a nationally known person. Their face will, they face, and you, you, let me tell you something. You take a kid that's been taught evolution. He has no roots in the scripture. He's messed with video games, shooting everybody all the time. He's taking drugs. By the way, I think they ought to ban video games, don't you? I mean, I don't know why Hollywood's not pushing for the ban of all these video games where they're killing each other. But you take a kid that he's evolutionized, okay? You take a kid, he's, he's maybe, he, saw, he watches all these Hollywood violence movies. I mean, you talk about hypocrisy, all these Hollywood idiots slam banging for uh, get rid of the, the Second Amendment. And they put out all the movies all the years of people murdering people and slaying people and all the murder slob. I mean, just killing people. And they're the ones who made the movies that people watch and say they got inspired to do what they're doing by watching so-and-so movie. And now these people made the movie saying they're against the Second Amendment. That's reprobate. But, but anyway, here's what I'm going to say to this is, is that when those people come down to that situation, what you're looking at is someone who's, they, they, if you don't punish criminals for the crimes, you're advancing crime. Yeah. Now, here's what I believe. And I'm saying this. I hope the whole world hears it. I'm telling you right now, when a person has committed a crime with a gun or a knife or any other way, he's, I'm telling you what, I'm talking about a, a crime that in the Bible, the Bible said what God gave to Moses the law. He said, by, he said, if any man sheds a man's blood, he said that man's blood will be, should be shed. Yeah. That was the institution of human government. Now, here's what I think ought to happen. You want to stop this nonsense about the abuse of the freedom of right to own guns? A piece of piano wire or rope, public national hanging on the school property. Amen. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I, I was raised in Douglas County, Missouri. Now you say, don't, don't you get racist on me. I still believe in hanging. You listen to me, I, you ain't going to politically correct me tonight. So get off of it. And I don't mean Jack maybe. The Bible talks about hanging. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm going to tell you right now, you take one of these little 16, 18 year old punks that went and shot up a bunch of people and you put him on 13 steps. You put him on national TV. Don't put a hood over his head so they can see his eyeballs pop out of his head. You let him, you let him, you have a camera hanging down there when that rope hits. And you watch his tongue st go, go about a foot out of his throat. You watch his eyeballs come out. You watch the blood hit his head. You watch him sit there and strangle himself to death. And there's going to be a bunch of kids think, I don't think I want to do that. That needs to happen in this country on national TV. And until we get back to, and by the way, I want to say something to you right now. I'm getting on a warfare down home. This drug trade, we need to catch people, we need to catch people who are pushing and selling drugs and hang them publicly. Yeah. Hang them. Yes. Public hangings. I'm going to tell you, I grew up in a home. We did not lock our doors. Yeah, I grew up at a time when I left my gun in the back of my pickup. I didn't even work. I didn't lock my truck when I went to town. I didn't think about nobody getting in my truck and stealing nothing. Yeah. We got away from God. Yeah. Now everybody's got dead bolts everywhere. Yeah. They got TV cameras everywhere. Why? Because we've deteriorated, got away from the root of the second amendment, which is the Bible, that man is created in the image of God. And I'm going to tell you little sucker something tonight. You kill another man, you do something to another person, you're attacking God. You listen to me. God created man in his own image. And when you do bodily harm to the person or the property of another man, you're attacking God. Amen. You're going to get it. That's why the Bible says murder of not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Yes. Now in scripture, and I'm going to take some time. I, I know we've, you've been very patient. But in Exodus 22, verse 2, the Bible teaches that and I'm just going to roll tonight. I'm not even going to turn it. I'll just give it. I'll paraphrase it and do Reggie's version and roll on. All right. But it talks about somebody breaking in your house. And you kill them. All right. Yes, sir. That's, that's Exodus 22 too. You write it down and you study it and you get home. And it talks about there. If he's leaving in the morning, it gives you the whole deal about it. But he broke in and he got, you had to kill him in that breaking in. You're, you're free to go. You're in good shape. No problem. Amen. You know what that's teaching you is you need to have arms to protect your family if somebody tries to break in. I'm glad to hear in Missouri that we have the castle law. Amen. Man's home is his castle. I'm glad whether that's in your house or whether it's in your pickup truck or your car. 
I'm going to tell you, nobody's got a right to pull a gun on you. Are you listening to me tonight? I'm telling you something. We need to fight against this stuff because we're made in the image of God. Life has value, and the principles of love and the principles of righteousness ought to be defended. Even we, And that's why Lee said, Henry said about to give me liberty or give me death because he knew this. If you forfeited your liberty, liberty, you were not a free man. You had forfeited the whole idea of God's value upon humankind. You've got to stand. Leviticus chapter 6 teaches us Verses 1 through 7, that when you do something against a person like that, you're doing it against the Lord, the Bible said. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible said, the man, the man. Now, you say, well, is, and, and I'm just going to hit this, you say that there are weapons in the Bible. You know there are. Hey, Moses had a rod. I'm going to tell you something. You say, well, hey, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I'll tell you what's got to do. Another guy named Shamar had an ox goat and killed 600 Philistines with it. Amen. An ox goat is a stick with a sharpened end on it. That's a weapon. He weaponized an, an, an agricultural tool. 600 Philistines he killed with his, with his ox goat. I don't want to mess with a guy like that. Amen. <laughs> then, you got, then you got Abraham in Genesis 14 when Lot was taken captive in the war. He had a group of 300 and some men. They were armed and trained, the Bible said. That's, your, that's where your forefathers, hey, talk about Second Amendment rooted. Now, what does your Second Amendment say? It said, talks about the militia. Is that not correct? Well, right? Let's, let's just get it here tonight. If I, if I got my constitution with you. I'm going to tell you a story about this little book I got in my hand before I get done, if I can think of it. Now, I should be able to quote it, and I can't. A well-regulated militia, and that's how it starts out. Now, there's where everybody gets booger booed at. A well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people. Now, this amendment, just like most, just like, did you know that we're not supposed to interpret the Bible? Yeah, that's right. No scripture is given of any private interpretation. I ain't got no business interpreting the Bible. That's why we got all this jumbo mumbo mess up. We're to rightly divide the word of truth, yeah. not interpret it. You let the Bible interpret itself by studying. The truth about it, we're so stinking lazy. We'd rather believe somebody's preaching like Reg Kelly. Or Reg Kelly said. Or Reg Kelly, no matter what Reg Kelly said. What's the Bible say? Rightly check it out. The believers in Thessalonica are more noble than those Berea. Then that they search the scriptures daily to see whether those things are so or not. Read it in your Bible. Now, what it, this, the Constitution is written in the same format. The Constitution is not to be interpreted. It's to be believed, practiced, and executed. The Bible is to be believed, practiced, and executed. Amen. All right, now, what, what Abraham had and your founding fathers got was for Abraham what's called a militia. I'll tell you a little story about militia. A fellow that I grew up around, he's kind of like a grandpa to me, his name is L.T. Hopper. L.T. told me that when he was a boy, now, so you, that, he was an old man whenever I was a boy, so that takes you way back. He said there was a couple moved in our area, down there in the sticks. And he said word got out before too long that they were not married. He said, Reggie, my dad and a bunch of men from the church in the area walked over to that house one evening, knocked on the door. Guy comes to the door and they said, sir, said, you're new in the area. Some of us met you, some of us ain't. They're telling that you and this woman ain't married. Is that true or false? He said, no, we're not married. And the spokesman for that group said, we're going to give you two nights to be gone or get married. You are not living this community shacked up like that, living together and not married. And they left. we got a different country. That's your militia. I'm not talking about mob violence. They didn't go over and try to string him up. I'm against that garbage. God never promotes mob violence. Never. But the militia was for raised together. Men who were armed and trained to come together for an emergency situation. Right. But the militia, now watch this. If you'll study your writings of your founding fathers, they explicitly distinguished between standing armies of the government yeah. and the militia. The militia in the Second Amendment is not what you think about as the army today or the Marines right. or the Navy right. at all. That was a militia was an armed citizen who was prepared to defend his personal freedom or his country's freedom. Yes. And mostly for the protection against a tyrant 
who would try to take control of the standing armies to come against the people. The militia was to come against the standing armies. Now, you won't hear that much, but that's fact. That is, you can study that out yourself. Now, David had his mighty men. And there's those, some of those men. You say, raise it as an army. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, those, those are the same idea as with those men. Nehemiah, he brought out, Holy Ghost, I'm glad you did, and I'm not going to go there now. But it talks specifically about your wives, your, your sons, your daughters. And that's a very in-family, personal father, husband responsibility. He said the people, by the way, it's in the book of Nehemiah, where the word people really stands out. You know what you have in your constitution, your preamble? The people. What do you have in your second amendment? The right of the people to bear arms. Come straight out of the book yeah. of Nehemiah. Chapter 4, verse 13 and on. What did they have? What did those people have? They had swords, spears. They had bows. They had weapons. They had harbogens. And they used them. Then in Judges chapter 3, you have a man with the name of Ehud. He's not with an army. He's all by himself. Walks into a guy's place. Left-handed, and he has what's called a dagger. That's a weapon. Two, it was a two-edged dagger. And he was left-handed, and he put that guy out of business. Now, then you have Jesus. Now, here's where I'm going to lose some of you. There is not ever in American history been a preacher like Jesus. There has not been a preacher like John the Baptist. I have not seen a preacher... Braid a rope or braid a whip and run a bunch of people out of church with it. Amen. If I came in here tonight or I went down to my church Sunday morning and I said a bunch of hypocrites sitting in here and getting tired and sick of it. You're making the house of God a den of thieves and went to slapping you with that thing and whooping on you and driving you out of the church house. It'd be in the Springfield newspaper. <laughs> Your sweet little Jesus did that. Right. And the problem with America is we've concocted another Jesus in our minds. That's right. He's another Jesus who doesn't, he doesn't stand up for anything. Right. Let me give you an Old Testament example about, about arms and defending people and taking up for people you don't even know. Moses ran off out, out of Egypt, you know. He gets up there around the priest of Midian. Is this correct or not? In Moses in chapter 3. Yeah. And he gets up there and, and the priest of Midian's daughters had come down and they were going to uh, water their sheep. And a bunch of sorry low down American, low down scumhead boys wouldn't let them get the water for their sheep. And they were giving the girls a hard time. And you know what the Bible says? Moses stood up for them. That's right. I want to tell you something. I'm, I'm Brother Mike and his family, and I'll tell you what, I, I said I'd have to, I'll have to eat half my farm to him for all the help to you, but I'm, I've written a book. And I've got a bunch in this book about this issue right here. I am sick to death of seeing these snowflake American men they're letting their wives be cussed, be cussed in front of. They're letting vulgar language be talked in front of their wives all the time. They're letting stuff be said that ought never be said in the presence. Now, half the fault is the women because the women have gotten crude and coarse in this country. And they don't give a rip. And they're just as nasty as the men. But I'm going to tell you something about my wife. Don't you ever cuss in front of my wife. I'll knock your teeth down your throat or sure try to. And I love, I love you. But you'll have to whoop me if you do that. And we need to get back to that. You say, well, that's old time chivalry. Well, chivalry is something out of the Bible too. Yeah. That men should take care and, and honor their wives. Yeah. And you ain't cussing around my wife. And you're not telling that joke around my wife. Nor yeah. me either, as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Amen. And you're not going to talk about that in front of my kids. Amen. Amen. And if we had some backbone and some men in this country again, who would get off their hind ends and be men like Moses was. Moses didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm stupid enough and, to realize that Moses might have had an ulterior motive. He might have looked at some of them girls and said, Woo, woo, she's good looking. And he might have said, you know, <laughs> that might have been. I don't know. I'm kind of adding the scripture there, right? But I'm telling you, I, I figure Moses had flesh in him like I got. And he's a single guy. He sees it. But you know what? That's, that's a pretty tough guy. One guy comes up as a bunch of guys over there treating women wrong. Walks up and, says, and stands up and says, you ain't treating these girls like that. I'll tell you, these girls, these girls getting woofed at, woof whistled at, and us daddies and brothers not doing nothing. I'll tell you what, I had three boys. Boom, 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 boom. Three boys came, then I had three girls. Boom, boom, boom. And I'll tell you right now, you pull something like that in front of um, one of my boys, in front of their sister, you have got a fight on your hands. There ain't no boy going to talk to my boy's sister like some dog. Amen. And, if the, and if their fist won't do it, then the guns will come out. Yeah. They ain't putting up with it. I taught my boys, I said, don't you ever let nobody treat them girls wrong. Amen. You don't let them do it. 
Well, anyway, so you've got all that. But Jesus, guess what he's coming back with? He's coming back to kill and slay. And I realize there's a sword that's coming out of his mouth, which is the word of God. But it still says it's a sword. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. He's coming back to fight and whip. And by the way, you know, he's, he's got the bride, the, the church of bride. And I'll tell you right now, he's going to whoop anybody that gets in the way and bothers his bride. Amen. That's why I'm happy to be in the church tonight. I love the church. I've got a heavenly bridegroom who ain't taking no flack and he ain't letting the devil mess with me. Amen. Amen. You need to remember that. He ain't like a bunch of us American husbands. Let people treat their wives like a dog. I guarantee you Christ is our bridegroom and he'll whoop anybody mess with his church. Amen. I like it. Amen. I like it. Now, we got some opposing scriptures. You'll have people come up and say, well, not when Cain killed Abel, Abel didn't do anything. He just let him kill him. You don't know that. You don't know that. You're reaching on past scripture yeah. when you say that. That's right. I don't know how it happened and neither do you. It says he rose up and killed him. Slayed him. But you don't know that Abel was a willing participant. You don't know that Abel said, well, I'm a pacifist and I'm not to have arms, so just do it. <laughs> you don't know that. I don't think he did that. I think, I think Cain, I'll tell you what I figure. I figure, I figure Abel had his back turned is what I figure. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you're going to add to scripture, make up a story about it, I'm going to say that Abel had his back turned and Cain was wroth and he was mad. He was a self-righteous hypocrite and he got mad at God and mad at, mad at him because the Bible tells you that. I think he snuck up behind him with a big rock and hit him in the back of the head. That's what I think. That's the kind of cowards people with people, robs and thieves and murderers are. They don't come in. I'm telling you, they'll they try to get you when you're asleep. They'll try to get you when your back's turned. They'll try to get you if they think you ain't got anything to defend yourself. They'll try to get to women. They'll try to get the old folks. I'm going to tell you something. I, 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 you have a big, good old, I'll tell you, I like, I, I'll tell you what, I had a good black friend. He, he's about like that, you know. I, I got to tell you this funny story. Would you, would you listen to this funny, would you let me tell you a funny story? I got a friend, I sold his dairy cows out North Springfield. Well, anyway, let me tell you the first story. I had a preacher friend named R uh, Reuben Fields. He's a boxer. He's about that. He's a black boxer. I mean, about, I mean, he's raw bone like that. And he's about 80 years old. That guy could still swing. I mean, he'd still move his feet, you know. And old Reuben, he, he don't, about, but I, I got a friend in Springfield. And he, he, he's got about 75 rental houses. I said, I wouldn't have them if you give them to you. He said, why not? I said, you can't get people moved out when they don't pay their rent. They won't move out. I had one house and I couldn't get, I couldn't get them to pay rent. And they wouldn't move out. I, I don't want no more. Oh, he said, it's easy. He said, it's easy. I said, how do you do that? Oh, he said, I got a big old black boy friend of mine. He said, he, he said, there's a big old, he said, he weighed about 320 pounds. He said, Reggie, he's big. I mean, he's big. And he said, if people won't pay their rent and I send them two or three notices, and they won't move out. He said, I just sent him over there with a suitcase. He says, Reggie, he'll come up the door and he knocks on the door and says, hey, how's y'all doing? They open the door and he just shoves the door open, walks in, said, I, I rented this house. And they said, no, it's our house. He said, no, that's my house. I, 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 here's my rental papers. You've been notified to get out of here a long time ago. This is my house now. And oh, it ain't your house. You get out of here. He, you know what he does? Well, first thing he does, walks in the bedroom. Tears their sheets and covers off. Puts his sheets and pillows on the bed. <laughs> then he walks in. Goes to their refrigerator. Goes to the refrigerator. Opens up and just starts eating everything in the refrigerator. <laughs> I love it. Amen. And then he said, uh, after that, said he cock, he'd go turn the TV on. Cock back in their recliner. And just sits there drinking their pop and eating their tater chips. And he said, I promise you, before the sun goes down, they moved out. <laughs> I love it. Amen. Amen. Anyway, I don't know why I got off on that. But I'm going to tell you right now. Now, somebody said, well, Reggie, Jesus said them that will live by the sword or die by the sword. That's true. But that is not in context with your person's personal defense. Now, you listen to me. They said, well, now, Peter got up. Got out that at night. And I'm going to tell you something. Peter wasn't aiming for his ear. Amen. He going to split that watermelon wide open. He just missed. That's what he did. And Jesus put that ear back on. Now, he did not tell Peter, go sell that sword and get rid of it. Right. Right. Put it back. Exactly. Saints, time for it. Yeah. Later on, what did he say? You go buy your sword. That's, right. yeah. That's what your Jesus did now. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, there ain't nobody got any right to walk up to you and tell you, hand your billfold over to me. Amen. And these liberal crowd telling you, now just don't resist them. Hand it over. Oh, 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 you ladies, if you get attacked, you just, you just yield to him. Let him rape you. 
and just hope that he doesn't kill you. So now all of a sudden we're slaves. Yeah. Oh, if you won't hurt me, I'll let you take everything I've got. Oh, if you won't kill me, I'll let you rape me. You're the masters of the universe. We're your little criminal. We're the slaves of the criminals now. We're already there, folks. We're going to lock our houses so you don't get us. A criminal ought to be so afraid to bust into your house. Amen. But, we're, Amen. but we're totally flipped. Right. And our schools are telling our kids, disarm, you don't want to have a pocket knife. <laughs> I've probably told you this before. My brother, when he was 16 years old, he ordered a, a, a 16 gauge bolt action sh shotgun out of, out of J.C. Penny catalog. Well, it came in the little old post office down there one school day. And I don't know how, but he found out. He probably called down and probably snuck in somebody's office and called the post office. And he found out his shotgun had got in. Well, he told old Alvy Rainey, the school principal now, and Alvy Rainey was a man who used to fast make your head. I'll tell you how Alvy Rainey was. You walk down the hallway of our school when I was in, when I was in high school, and your shirt tail's hanging out, he would give you one shot. He'd just do like that, get that in. If you didn't get that in, you was headed down there to his two-foot walnut 18-hole paddle. Yeah. I'm not joking you. He told you, he told you put your hands on that desk. No, he said, yeah. Yeah, he, he said, stick your rear end out. They ain't out far enough. Yeah. Amen. And he didn't do this here. He, way back up there. I've seen it. Myself. <laughs> I've seen it myself. He way back up. Boom! I'm telling you what, you're, you'd, just, you'd go like this. Boom! You didn't go back to your class. You went in the boys' bathroom and cried. You didn't want nobody to see you crying. If he didn't make you cry, he didn't feel like he whooped you. You said, I've seen tougher men than probably anybody in this church. I'm talking about boys that bucked hay bales day after day, 1,000, 1,500 bales a day. Boys have more muscle and bull like this. I mean, knock you up. They could run five. I, I'm talking about boys that could run 10 miles and never stop. I've seen them whoop them till they cry. But I guarantee you one thing, there wasn't no rot went on in that school. Yeah, but you know what old Alvy did? Oh, Alvy, my brother walked and said, Alvy said, my gun's down there at the post office. Why, he said, Steve, get in my truck, let's go get it. <laughs> they did. They went, he, the principal took my brother down to the post office to get his new rifle, brought it back to school, put it in the room, said, hey, all you boys come in here, look at this gun. Now we're living in a different land. Yeah. Now, if you now evidently, I guess if you just go to the shooting range, yeah. Yeah. they're gonna call the cops to investigate you. Stupidest bunch of junk I ever seen in my life. I don't tell you right now. Anyway, the opposing. Oh, then here's the one they love. Turn the other cheek. All right, I'm not against that, and there's a place for that. Yeah. But that's not that's not talking about when somebody breaks into your house or pulls a gun on you, wanting yeah. to rob you. Right. That's talking about you having a, di a dispute with some man, some, and usually somebody you know, and he pops you one, and, and you're not into some kind. He's not, watch this, he's not threatening your life. Amen. Yeah. He's not trying to rob you. You and him are having a dispute. Amen. Has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. Yeah. Nothing to do with it. There's a deeper truth to everything we're looking at tonight, Amen. and that's this. If the Bible said, because of the transgressions of the land, Amen. many other princes thereof. In the end, it won't be the government that takes our guns, folks. It'll be our sinfulness. Amen. Right. God will judge this nation yeah. because of our sin. Yeah. He took the freedom away from the Israeli people, yeah. in the Old Testament, yeah. because they turned away from him. And they became captives and they had their arms taken away from them because they sinned. It's not going to be the fault of the government. Amen. It's going to be the fault of the American people who have rejected this book. Amen. That's why our Second Amendment is rooted in the Bible. Amen. And if we're going to keep the Second Amendment, we're going to have to have our lives rooted in the Bible. Amen. As people reject God's laws, God's grace, God's truth, God's righteousness, God allows our freedoms to be taken away from us. And our forefathers warned us of that. We're now being told by the liberal and progressive, the reprobates, even some police. I love Sheriff Clark. Yeah. If I was in a foxhole, I'd want him with me. Yeah, amen. 
That guy's got more sense than... But we're being told by even some police, and I'm going to tell you a sad story here pretty soon, that we should not resist violence, that we should just let them have what they want, whether it's our wives or our daughters, our children, or ourselves, or our property. We're being told to you poor ladies that you're supposed to use some kind of a non-lethal weapon such as a whistle. Or you're supposed to get out some kind of mace. What did I do with it? Where's my mace? I got a friend who's uh, had a wreck and he's 16 years old. Paralyzed him from here down. 16 years old. Just a great guy. He's coming from North Carolina out to see me a few years ago. And a whole carload of young men. They got to honking him. Pulling in front of him. Pulling behind him. Trying to run him off the road. They pulled up beside him and. I mean, they were giving him the language. And now they don't even know this guy can't walk, okay? He's driving his little, uh, kind of like a blazer type deal. And they kept it up for a little bit. And all of a sudden, he just reached over and pulled his 9M up and went just like that right there. A carload of thugs is going to rob that boy. That 9M was the great equalizer. Yeah. Let me give you a truth about guns and the cross. The cross is the great equalizer. Amen. All ground is level at the cross. Amen. I'm trying to lead a Japanese lady to the Lord right now. She has no comprehension. She has no... When you talk to her about spiritual things, Brother Mike, she just said... You know what her statement was to me? I don't do religion very well. She has no spiritual comprehension. But I'm going to tell you something right now. Our Lord Jesus Christ died for that Japanese woman just the same as he died for this old American boy right here. Yeah, and, that, and I'm telling you, when we come to the cross, I don't care what color your skin is, and I don't care what your degrees are, and I don't care how much money you got. I don't care. I don't give a rip what you are. You're going to get level with God. Everybody's level at the cross. Amen. And what a gun does, it levels the playing field. Yes, you can have a little old woman... She's five foot two and weighs about 110 pounds. And some, here comes some thug out behind a bush and she pulls out her judge yeah. and points it to him. All of a sudden the, ground's at, the ground is level. Yeah. Amen. Amen. God always has ways of equalizing and leveling the ground out. He is no respecter of persons and he has made a way that the weak, Amen. are you listening to me? Yeah. That the weak could match the strong. We're told now to use these non-lethal means. Uh, let me just tell you, in case somebody's listening to this and you're an idiot. <laughs> and some thought goes through your mind about some of my family. Well, I've got a wife and three daughters. And I've bought them all what's called a judge. How I many knows what a judge is? Amen. A judge is a gun. That's, it's, it's a six-round, 410 shell. And in that shell, it's got pellets and it has uh, slugs. And they don't just have to perfectly aim at you just in the general direction. And I've told my daughters and I've told my wife, when you sense in your spirit, it's on, don't, don't hesitate. Boom, boom, boom. Don't stop. Empty right. it on him. Right. Put him in hell. Yeah. We'll deal with the ramifications of it later. I do not intend, by the grace of Almighty God, by neglecting to provide for my daughters to ever have to deal with a situation where they've been taken advantage of by somebody. It's lunacy. We tell our wives to carry a whistle or carry some mace. I don't know how many have ever watched some of the videos about the, the bear mace, but you're not getting me out in the mountains with bear mace. And somebody says, well, Reggie, uh, you can't stop him with an I, 9 m -M. I'm going to feel a lot better about dying with an IMM. -M. I'm not going to say, that. I wish I'd had a 9 m, -M. <laughs> Have you ever seen the movies where they try to spare, you know, bear charge him? <laughs> I, I, not me. I'm going to tell you something. The very fact that we're selling all our wives and buying mace for our wives is telling criminals she ain't got nothing on her. Yep. She ain't got nothing on her. Yeah. Crime is an act of enslavement. A few years ago, a good friend, a dear person to me, was moved, going from one side of Mountain Grove, Missouri to the other. 
pick up some tools. We got on the other side of town and the police had a deal where they stopped to check you for your insurance papers. Everybody know what I'm talking about? What's that called? Anybody know? Checkpoint. Checkpoint. He got in line. They're checking people, checking their license and checking their insurance papers. When they come, when he pulls up and they come up to sight him, they said, need to see your license. So my son reached right here and opened up his console in his truck. And right there, of course, is his pistol. But his license is in there. That's where he keeps his license. He got his license, started to hand it to the, this is a town officer in the town, city, a city officer. He takes his license and he says to him, I want that gun. My son said, you what? He said, I want that gun till this thing's over with, till we get down to the checkpoint. My, my son said, you have no basis to ask for my gun. I did not speed. I did nothing wrong. I'm going through your checkpoint. You do not have a basis to ask me for my gun. That cop pulled his pistol out and stuck it to my son's head. Screamed for other cops to come. And they drug my son out. My son never handed over his gun. And I have to give him credit. Amen. He had guts. Yeah. He never handed over his gun. He left it lay right there. They, caught, they took his gun, threw him on the ground, handcuffed him, and took him down to the city hall. When I got the call, I went straight up to city hall. By that time, they had let him out. And that, I almost acted like nothing happened. I said, no, you're not getting by with this. I said, I want everybody in, this, in, that, in that chamber right now. They would not bring the officer in that did this. They had the city administrator, the mayor, chief of police, and another police officer in there. I asked him, I said, what's going on? Well, he didn't obey a lawful command. I said, that was not a lawful command. He has a constitutional right to bear arms. He was doing nothing wrong. He was violating no law. And you told him you wanted his arms. You did not have a lot. That was not a lawful order. He said, well, he should have obeyed it anyway. I said, for what reason? I said, upon what, upon what basis? He said, well, he, he just should have. He said, we just do that for safety's sake. So I said, so you can disarm people just because arbitrarily you feel like it against their constitutional right to bear arms. The mayor had the audacity to tell me, he said, Red, just wonder he didn't, that officer didn't kill him. I said, I want to tell you one thing right now. That officer would be awful glad he didn't. Right. Now, you listen to me. This conversation went stupidly on for a while, and I could see I was getting nowhere. These guys just, and I'm like, I can't believe this is my hometown. This is the mayor of my hometown. This is the chief of police of my hometown. This is the city mission. The mayor said to me, I have a, I, and I don't know why this came to me. I'm sitting at the end of the table. They're sitting down right there. And I, I'm telling you, I don't, know, I don't even know why in that particular case I had, a, I had a cop of the Constitution with me, but I did. And I seen this going nowhere, so I just stood up and I, I said this. I said, before I go, I said, I don't know where this is going, but it's, it's not going to go a good place, I can tell you. Because you guys have violated the Constitution of the United States. And I said, you violated that boy's rights. I said, what scares me is what you do with other people. And I asked, Obama was in office. I said, I want to ask you guys a question before I go. If Obama called down here, the DOJ or whatever it might be, Homeland Security, they all said that you're supposed to confiscate all the guns in Mountain Grove in your jurisdiction, would you do it? The chief of police took his head without question. <laughs> so I took my constitution out and this is what happened. I slit, I, I just tossed, I went like that. I said, you need to read this. I said, did you know at that point, and you know what he did? He, it, it slid toward him. He took it and goes, I don't care what that says. Are you talking about alarming a country boy like me? I said, well, I want to tell you something right now. I said, you know something I know you did? I said, you took an oath to uphold this thing when you took this office. And I said, as of right now, you're in violation of your oath. And I said, I have no basis to obey you about anything you say because you have violated your oath. You're no longer an officer of the law. You are not a minister for good. Right. You're a minister for evil. And they said that if Obama, and the mayor said, well, I've got an, a, he said, I've got an AR in 200 rounds. He said, if, he said, I'd hand them in. 
I said, you guys have sold your liberty and sold your freedom. That happened in my hometown. If you don't think this thing is, this is down in, this is down in hillbilly redneck country. And I told him, I stood right there at the end, I said, every one of you has lost me. I said, I know every one of you. I've known most of your parents. I said, you've lost my respect, you've lost my obedience, everything. You forfeited right here today. I said, and further, I'm going to tell you something, Mr. Mayor and Chief of Police. If you did what you say you're to do, there'll be blood running down the streets of Mountain Grove. I said, there'll be a war going on in this town. You are not taking the guns of the people in this just because Obama told you to. I walked out of there. The mayor comes trotting up behind me when I got outside. He goes, Rich, Rich. He said, I probably should have thought about that, what I said. I turned around to him. I said, you should have thought a long time about what you said. I said, this is the awfulest viper's nest of garbage I've ever heard tell of in my life. I said, you guys are a threat and an enemy of the United States and the people of the United States. I said, it's time you men started reading your constitution again. I said, I'm going to tell you right now, this constitution is above any law in this land. It is, uh, it's above any law that you or anybody else or Congress or anybody else makes. This is the law of the land. And you are bound. You are bound to obey this, to support it, to uphold it, to enforce it. And you violated it. Long story short, they wound up, quote, drop the charges. I want you to listen to an excerpt, and he did a while ago, but this is a different one from a sermon in 1747. It might be, I don't think it is. Here's what a preacher said back in those days. He that suffereth his life to be taken from him by one that hath no authority for that purpose, when he might have preserved his life by self-defense, that man incurs the guilt of self-murder. Since God hath enjoined him to seek the continuance of his life, and nature itself teaches every creature to defend itself. You know what that preacher was telling him? Yeah. He said, if you will not defend yourself with arms, you are complicit to your own. He said, it's like committing suicide. You've murdered yourself. Yeah. I want you to consider God and Satan for just a moment. And I alluded to this early in the message, and I'll try to finish. Christ came to give us life. He went to war with Satan on the cross. He stepped up and defended us with his own life. Eternal life is the offspring of his work at Calvary. It's the essence of salvation. On the other side, Satan, the Bible calls him a murderer. And he seeks to deny everyone the gift of eternal life. The Bible even calls him a murderer. To die lost. If you're listening to me tonight and you're not saved, you've never been born again in the Spirit of God, to die lost is to allow your spiritual murder by Satan. You think about that for a minute. When you could have pulled down the defenses of heaven, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the cross and pulled it, held that cross against Satan, and by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you could have conquered that murderer in Jesus' name. I'm not talking about self-righteous nor work salvation. I am saying that the means, the arms by which you could have prevented self-murder and murder by Satan, you refused to take in arms. That cross is the arms of God. To destroy the one who wants to murder you. And God tells you and I. Take that weapon. Use it on him. I would like to say a word about arms. Before I close. And I'm, I'm going to cut out about two thirds of this message. Just for time's sake. The brother was so gracious. I'm not very gracious. And I wish I had your gracious. Opposition to the Second Amendment or the perversion of it is either by ignorance, which is a lot of our nation today, or it's by cowardice. 
We're seeing the rape of dignity and the value of God given human life. Let me say to you, I respect police. I'm not against policemen. The fact of it is, I teach our children, I teach, I, I teach our church, respect those in authority, pray for those in authority. But they were never designed to be our bodyguards. The police were never designed to be our bodyguards. And if we had a shooting right here tonight, how long would it take the cops to get here? And if there weren't enough people here armed, by the time somebody got here, half of us be dead or all of us. I tell them at our church, you come in here and mess with us, you're going to look like a piece of Swiss cheese. You're going to have so many holes in you. <laughs> but we've lost this thing of the depravity, the root of being in that. And I just want to say again that the American gun owners are not the problem. It's having God removed from our society. When you take the Ten Commandments out of a school place that says thou shalt not kill, what do you expect? Then you add the drugs and the liquor and the violence that we have. And it's amazing to me that the anti-Second Amendment crowd, they want to be guarded by law officers. But they don't want you and I to have guns. The Declaration of Independence, the main purpose of the Constitution was, in that Second Amendment, is to protect people from a tyrannical government. The, and the Declaration even says it's our right and our duty to throw off such governments should that occur. Yeah, it is. And so how are we to throw off a government that has violated the Constitution? With feathers? With words? Can we oritate and have such great oratory that we can convince them to not conquer us? The Second Amendment defines itself. The militia is the people. A militia of the people versus a standing army from a tyrant. And it tells you and I that we can keep and bear arms. Now, I want to close with this. Concealed carry is unconstitutional. Every person in this room has a right, but from this Constitution, to bear arms, it doesn't say if you took a concealed carry class. It doesn't even say you have to conceal them. In fact, it says bear them. Then it says it shall not be infringed. Doesn't add anything to it. Doesn't take, just says shall not be infringed, period. You see what I mean by interpreting the Constitution rather than accepting it for what it says? And then here's the big one. <clears throat> it says the right to keep and bear arms. Hmm, arms. arms. There's no slide scale here. There's no further definition. You know what that means? That I can have a bump stock. I can have a fully automatic. I can have a bazooka. I can have a tank. If I so choose to by the Constitution, there is no restriction in the Second Amendment in its arms. It did not say hunting rifles. It didn't say target rifles. It didn't say pistols. It said arms. And by that it means that the people need enough power, military armed power, to resist a statist army, a standing army against the people. No mention of the calibers. No mention of the rounds. It's not there. All of this, hey, I hate to tell you this tonight, we're way down the pike. We've already surrendered to, well, I got my conceal and carry. So you already sold out, did you? I don't. Amen. I'm not going to get me a concealed carry. Amen. I've, got a, I've got my permit right here in this Constitution. Better think about it. Sure. Freedom and liberty are not gifts of the state. They're gifts of God. And that's what they're telling you. Yeah. They cannot be taken because they're given. I want to thank you all for being so kind and gracious tonight and putting up with me. I've, I've done my rant. And uh, I know that some people may not go along with that like that. But I'm going to tell you right now, your Constitution, which, you, which we will tout the Constitution, but then when it comes right down to it, what kind of edge? Yeah. It doesn't tell you that it's got, it can't have a bump stock or a fully automatic or a tank or a hauser. I'd like to have a good old 50 caliber, wouldn't you? 
something that'll blow a hole about that big. And, yeah. yeah, you know, I want. Here's what I want. I want a. I want a. I want a nice Jeep that I can mount a 50 cal in. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And I don't. I don't want to use it unless the government gets out of hand. You won't need to. You won't yeah. need to use it if you have it. You won't need to. Right. And uh, so here's what I figured. Well, things get bad enough. At least I've got. I, I, I could yeah. tell you some things not scare some of you. But I'm, I'm more prepared than you might think I am. <laughs> I'll just give you this little hint. If it ever breaks out, call me. Let me have my you, microphone. You. Give him a hand. Well, oh, I tell you what, he knows how to wire you up worse than a gate. <laughs> he didn't know you. that with these, I had the detonator in my pocket. <laughs> <clears throat> Casey got out of line. That's good, amen. That's what that's what God laid on my heart when I saw Chris Pinto talk and say what he said. That's what God put in my heart. And I've done the study on this. I've done a study on the word sword in the Bible. The first place, the very first place is mentioned is God used a flaming sword in defense of the way of the tree of life. The idea was that sword was to never, God knew that he would never have to use it because just the sight of it would protect the, the tree of life. Amen. Nobody in their right mind is going to walk past that sword. They're going to get their head cut off. They know it. And it's just the idea that if you are armed, you understand that knowing that you're armed, you will more than likely never have to use it. And that's, that's where, that's, you go look, read your Bible. First place, the sword's ever mentioned, right there in Genesis chapter 3. And it's the idea is that it keeps the way of life. And he's right in everything that he said. And I appreciate him. You're ready to go home. Let's stand to our feet. Appreciate you coming. Be back tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Chris is going to speak. I'm going to speak. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you what the Bible says about the sword. And remember what I said last night. You're the militia. You're the militia both of our nation and of our churches. It's not just the preacher who has the right to wield the sword. It is the pew man, the people who must keep the way of the tree of life. As long as they'll protect it, the pulpits will never go bad. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you for guiding us tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord. God, you reminded me that I was created in your image. You have given me life. You have given me internally the desire to keep my own life because that's you. God, you are life. You have given me and put it in my heart to keep and protect my wife, my daughters, my sons, my grandchildren, and the people of this church. It's their life that is important to me. And Father, we just help us, God. As church members, as countrymen, to get back to the idea that we were created in your image. And God, you are life. And you have put life in us. And help us to preserve the way of life. Blessing out of your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. God bless you. You're dismissed. Come back. See you. See you tomorrow.